sworn in judge, you may be seated. Folks, have seats, please. Ms. Soule, you and the defendant have a child together. Yes. According to your complaint, the defendant came to visit the child and stayed overnight. Mm -hmm. You claim that he stole your wallet, which contained your debit card, and used it mm -hmm. to the tune of $175. Yes. And the defendant says he didn't do it. You, now, you didn't see him take your wallet. No, I did not. But you had your wallet when he was there. Yes, I did. And then from your complaint, when he left, you went to work the next day, and you didn't have your wallet. What did you do at that point? Well, I decided I thought maybe I, I misplaced it somewhere, so I looked all over the place. It was not there. So I called his cell phone, which is the only number I have, and I left message after message to call me back to see if maybe he saw it somewhere. And he never called me back for days and days and days. And I didn't hear from him until like two days ago. But I started getting overdraft charges at my bank. They started mailing me overdraft charges. Give me the charges. date that he was there. February 17th of this last year. OK, go ahead. So they gave me a printout of my bank statement. So I have here printed out, circled the ones that I did not do. So they went and they started filling out paperwork to do an investigation to find the money. So all my money is on hold. But I have proof here from that. So I went to the places on the paper to talk to the people that work there, maybe get receipts. Were they receipts. stores? Yes, they're, very, they're stores in the gas station. And I got credit Purchased slips. Purchased from? Pyromania Glass Studio. Is what, what is that? It's a glass blowing place. They buy glass floats. Uh huh. I mean, that's all I saw when I went in there. OK, and what, what other store? A Chevron gas station. So whoever it was who took your wallet, made a purchase and used a debit card for $145 for a piece of glass. Yes. And then $30 for gas. Yes. OK. Were you able to get the receipts? I was. And they made copies for me. And right now, I have a, a witness right now, Rena Salzer, who is a handwriting expert. And she can verify that those are Scott's handwriting. So on the 17th, which was the day he left, mm -hmm. Left on the 17th. So on the 17th, someone purchased this piece of glass yes. for $145. And then on the 18th, someone purchased gas for $30. Mm -hmm. And I knew that wasn't me. I only get gas in Toledo. So that wasn't and me. And this is in? Newport. N Newport? Oregon. Oregon. Mm -hmm. Where does he live? Newport, Oregon. Well, I, I don't know where he lives. He stays wherever he wants. But is that where you were living in Newport, Newport, Oregon? I am now. I wasn't at the time. I was living in Toledo. What are you doing in Newport, Oregon now? Who lives there now? Um, that's just where I ended up living, just because I didn't feel like living with my parents anymore. Didn't feel like staying with my moms. And as far as her wallet goes, I would have been gone the day before, but she refused to give me a ride home. And I've never seen her wallet. I have okay. my own. Ah, oh. you have your own wallet? Yeah. <laughs> but you don't have your own debit card. I don't need a debit card. OK. Let me hear you witness. Is that you? Rena. Step up, please. Tell me your name. Rena Salzer. Ms. Salzer, I have a few preliminary questions before I can permit you to testify as an expert witness. First, I'd like to ask Mr. Gifford, I want you to look at these two documents, sir. I want you to look at the handwriting on these two documents. And I want you to tell me if you recognize that handwriting. Nope. Looks like it could be anyone's handwriting to me. I didn't ask you that. <laughs> No, I don't recognize it. OK. How long, by the way, did you live together? Off and on for about a year. We were only dating for a couple of months. And how old is your child? She'll be two on the 2nd of May. OK, but you lived together for a year? Off and on. Off and on. Who paid the bills? Me. I just have to know whether he had an opportunity to see your signature. Yeah. Well, my license was in my wallet also. And on the license, it's good. It's signed. Your signature, yes. OK. All right, Ms. Salsa. Have you ever testified as an expert witness in any court? No. I've worked with attorneys on various cases that have involved questioned documents. But none of the cases have gone to court. OK, so you have been utilized by attorneys, by private Correct. attorneys. Are you registered anywhere as a handwriting analyst? Uh, yes, I am on the public defender's list. Where? Los Angeles. What kind of credentials do you have to present in order to go on the public defender's list? I have to present my education in the field, as well as the fact that I have apprenticed with a board-certified document examiner for the past several years. With whom have you apprenticed? Eva Salzer. Is that your mother? In-law. Mother-in-law. But you have been certified to be on the public defender's list 
as an analyst in documents. Correct. Okay. Did you have an opportunity to examine this document? Yes. We have to look at it first. And I also have exemplars of Mr. Gifford here, if you would like to see them. How did you obtain the handwriting exemplars of the defendants? They were given to me upon my arrival here today. Here? Correct. Good. So your analysis of the handwriting was really done today? Correct. Can I see the handwriting exemplars that were furnished by Mr. Gifford? Would you show these exemplars to Mr. Gifford so that he can verify that the, this is his handwriting? Is your handwriting, is it not, sir? Yep, sure is. Okay. Were you able, Ms. Salsa, to draw with a reasonable degree of scientific certainty a conclusion with regard to whether it was Mr. Gifford who signed the plaintiff's name to these two debit slips? Yes. And what was the conclusion that you drew? My professional opinion is that it is highly probable that Mr. Gifford executed the question six. Testifying on Carrie's behalf is handwriting expert Rena Salzer. Now, on what do you base that? The idiosyncrasies present in Mr. Gifford's handwriting or his signatures are also present in the question signatures of Ms. Soule. Explain here. it to me. I have both in front of me. Okay. The formation of the capital S is identical. It is a rather peculiar formation at that, so that is definitely an identifying characteristic. They both have the same slant and letter proportion. You'll notice that the height of the upper extensions goes quite high up. Mm -hmm. The eye dots are dashed. The connecting strokes are rather jagged, so the movement of the writing is very jerky looking. Uh, the relationship to the baseline is also consistent. It either rests on it, goes a little bit below, or a little bit above. Uh, the stroke structure of the small a and o is also formed similarly, an initial loop that is horizontal in, in, in the way that it is formed. The combination of all of these characteristics tells me that the writer of the question signatures and the exemplars of Mr. Gifford are the same. The only thing that would make my opinion stronger is if Mr. Gifford were to sign Ms. Soule's name right now. Well, the problem is he is already on notice, Ms. Salsa, so that... Okay. Do you understand? He's yes. already on notice that that's what you're asking him to do. But I have followed very carefully your mm -hmm. testimony with regard to the various structures of the letters, with regard to how he dots both signatures, the letters that you refer to, so I believe that you are in all probability correct with regard to your ultimate analysis that within a reasonable degree of certainty, you can say that the same person signed these documents. Mr. Gifford, let me explain something to you. This is not a criminal proceeding. I don't know whether in a criminal proceeding, certainly you've had the opportunity to take the plaintiff's wallet. You probably had the inclination as well because according to you and the few words that you've said so far here today, you were royally annoyed that she would not give you a ride home. I have examined these handwriting exemplars that you gave as, as relating to the documents that were signed, the forged documents, and I do believe that you forged her signature, which means that you stole her wallet and her debit card. Could I say that beyond a reasonable doubt? Probably not. Fortunately, in this proceeding, that is not the burden of proof. The burden of proof here is a mere preponderance of the evidence. More evidence than not that you're a thief, which I find. Judgment for the plaintiff in the amount of $175. That's all. Parties are excused. You may step out. He's been stealing from a lot of people. He stole from me before, and I should have known better. There's a bunch of people that could have a bunch of different signatures. I was out camping. Still have no clue what the she's talking about. Stay away from men like that. Thought that I don't want to be with her. And now, the next case. All parties in the matter of Solomon versus Guerrero, step forward, please. 23-year-old administrative assistant, Desiree Solomon, is suing her former live-in boyfriend, 
31-year-old salesman Anthony Guerrero for carpeting, a bedroom set, and a cell phone bill. Anthony is countersuing. He wants the big screen TV. Ms. Solomon, according to your complaint, you and the defendant were in a relationship. You moved into a home that was owned by the defendant's mother. Correct. You say it was in relatively poor condition at the time. The defendant had his daughter living with him. Is that right, sir? Every other weekend. You worked on the house, cleaned the house, painted some painting. But in addition to that, you claim that you purchased carpeting for the house. Correct. You purchased a bedroom set for the defendant's daughter. Correct. And then there was an issue of a cell phone bill. You separated because you claimed there was some sort of an altercation with the defendant, and you want to be reimbursed for the carpeting, the cell phone bill, and his daughter's bedroom set. The defendant says that the carpeting was your idea, that the bedroom set was also your idea and a gift to the child, and he doesn't know anything about the cell phone bill. We'll get to that. But he is counterclaiming because he says when you left, you took a large screen TV that belongs to him. Correct? Yes, sir. Okay. When did you separate? September of 2001. When was the carpeting purchased? August of 2001. Now, tell me about the carpet purchase. I spoke with Mr. Guerrero, and he didn't have good credit because he had a bankruptcy on his credit due to a DUI, and he, I purchased the carpet for the house. Now, that doesn't tell me anything. That doesn't tell me that it was a loan. Well, he, he, he knew that was an agreement. He told me he would pay me back for this carpet if I purchased it for this house. Tell me the conversation as you remember it. I think I remember it. We talked to each other on the phone, and we came to the agreement. He had some green carpet in there that was uh, his mother and his stepfather lived in, and he smoked, and the carpet was just kind of like riddled with smoke, and his dad, I think his stepdad was like alcoholic, and it just didn't have a good smell to it. Let me hear the conversation. Usually when two people are living together and they want to buy something, they say, listen, the carpeting is really gross. Right. That now was, let's get rid of it. And that was a conversation, and he agreed to pay for the carpeting. We is that right, sir? No, ma'am. Let no, me hear the story. Your Honor, if, if we would have had a conversation like that, we probably would have had it at the house where we sit down and made a decision uh, tell like me that. Tell me how was no the carpeting came to be put down in the house. She went to the carpet place, picked the carpet out, picked the design of the carpet, made the color of the carpet all by herself, told me... Hey, um, can you take this day off? Um, I bought carpet, and they're going to be putting it in this day. Can you take this day off and be there to do it? And I said, you did what? And she goes, yes, I got carpet. I go, why? Well, it doesn't match the furniture. It's green, and the furniture is, you know, a beige color. And I'm like, I guess. I did, was there. I was there to, when she, you know, when they put it in. But in no way did we have a conversation stating anything about, hey, let's go get carpet. All right, let me hear about the bedroom set, Ms. Solomon. Okay, Tony, when uh, he moved in the house, I had my own bedroom set that I brought in, and he didn't have any furniture. I brought the furniture in. And, of course, he wanted to get a bedroom set for his daughter, make the room kind of nice for her. So we went out together and purchased a bedroom set for his daughter using my credit also. So? He told me he would pay me back $100 per month for this bedroom set. Tell me about that. Actually, she wanted to get this certain bedroom set for my daughter. You know, I... Like she said, my credit wasn't the best, so I was going to go out and get my daughter a nice bedroom set, but not the bedroom set that she had chosen. But she wanted to get that. Anyway, neither way, I have five canceled checks right here along with the receipts showing where I paid $500 to her with the furniture, or stating on it right there, furniture to Desiree Solomon. That was for your daughter's furniture? Yes, ma'am. Let me see it. And this is also a copy of the... Did he give you one, two, three... For $519 towards the furniture? Yes, and that was with the cell phone bills. He told me he was going to help me pay for the cell phone bills. Just a minute. This says furniture on it. Yeah, I know, but one month it was for cell phone bills. He paid me two payments in one month, and one was that to help me with the cell phone. How much was the furniture? $579, Your Honor. Is that right? Yes. So he practically paid you for the bedroom furniture. Correct. So what do you want? I'm wanting the carpet. The carpet. The carpet you're not going to get. Carpet, I don't believe that you had an agreement when you purchased this carpet that he was going to pay you back for it. I wouldn't have purchased the carpet if he wasn't going to pay me back. I don't have that kind of money. But I believe that he said he would buy the child's furniture and that he would reimburse you. I don't believe you with regards to the carpet. That's my prerogative. That's my job. Okay, now let's get to the cell phone bill. Here's the cell phone bill. Show it to him. Your Honor, we broke up in... September. She has bills here for October. 
Because you told me to keep the phone on and you would pay me. She has bills. Because I didn't want to get charged an early termination fee, $150. I don't even know what she has on here. It's your phone number. Did anybody use the phone after you separated? Yeah, he did. Did you pay any of those bills? No, ma'am. You did not? All right. So I asked her to send me a list so I could look at phone numbers, Your Honor. Okay. And she sent me one piece of paper setting uh, an, an amount on there and that was But, but now you looked at the bill? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And how much is that bill? Altogether, $399.17. So between that and the $79 that he owes you still for the furniture, because he only gave you $500, the furniture was $579, that's $478. Correct. Okay, good. Now, tell me about this big screen TV. Your Honor, uh, one day I came home from work. She's a very materialistic person. She wanted this, she wanted that in the house, she wanted everything perfect in the house. So she could have people over, show everybody how nice our house was. Good. But well, that's okay, what women that's do. Fine. Women nest. I come home from women, work one day. Mr. Guerrero, women nest. <laughs> you don't care if the carpet is green and the furniture is orange. Men don't care about that. <laughs> there are some men that care, most don't. Okay, so she want, she's materialistic, she wanted her house to look nice. Right, so I came home one day, she says, I'm walking in the living room to the TV room, she's standing there looking like Vanna White with a big TV. <laughs> and she tells me, this is for you, now you can have your friends over here. Because there were times on the weekends where I was going to my brother's house, my cousin's house, watch football, they had big screen TVs. She goes, this is for you, I bought this, you can have your friends over here. So what you're telling me is, she bought the TV as a gift for you. Right. And then when she left, she took it. Right. Try this, sir. This is so you can have your friends over and watch TV. Mm -hmm. Try that. Does that sound right? So you want the TV and the new carpet? Right. She's got the TV now, right? Right. She keeps it. OK. Perfect. OK? Yeah, I've been making payments on it. I had the statement here. He's suing for $3,000. I think it's kind of funny. The TV's only 2000 Listen, you keep the TV. OK. Out of this deal, it cost you a little bit of beige carpet? It, it cost me more than that, you know? Probably. And a cell phone bill. All right. He owes you $478, judgment for the plaintiff. That's all. Parties are excused. You may step out. Your Honor, this is case number 571 on the calendar in the matter of Harper versus Boozer. Parties have been sworn in, Judge. You may be seated. Ladies, have seats, please. Ms. Harper, the defendant was a friend of yours, according to your complaint. You loaned her some money. According to you, you have a note to prove the loan. She did not repay you the entire amount, and you want it. Is that what this is about? Yes. Defendant says she borrowed some money, not as much as you claim. She paid you back every cent that she owes you. So, when did you make this loan, and why? I made the loan to Lisa on 6 because she had written 6 fraudulent checks and she needed the money to repay the checks. Well, how did you find out about this need that she had for the money? She called me on 6-19 at 10 o'clock in the morning and asked me to pick her up from work because she had a warrant out on for these checks. So. She had a warrant out? Mm-hmm. How much money did she tell you she needed? Twelve something, twelve hundred and something dollars. Go ahead. I had a, um, <clears throat> a loan that I had had previously and I had paid it off. So she asked me if I could help her. Could I see if I could borrow the money from there to, to help her out? What money? Explain that to me. I borrowed some. I had a loan already at um, First Franklin. It was, you know, where I could go back and borrow money if I needed to. So then I, I called them and I asked her, could I borrow $1,200? And she said I could borrow up to 2000 So I told her I didn't need that much, that I needed 1200 so I had to do 1500 Why did you have to do 15 They didn't, I couldn't borrow $1,200. So let me see the loan papers where you borrowed 1500 Okay, and the total payments that you had to make with all the interest that they add up was 2280 on this 1500 Yes, ma'am. Okay, go ahead. So then I got the money, and the, the, they wrote me out a check, and I had to take the check to the bank, and I cashed the check. And me and my witness, Alice Towner, we went. I had to pick her, Alice, up to take her to work. So we went to Lisa's sister's house, and I gave her $1,480. And I had her sign. Now, let me see the note that you say you had her sign. You show the defendant this and ask her if it's her signature. 
Is that your signature? Yes, it is. Fine. Okay, so I'm going to read this note. It says, I, uh, Regina Harper, that's you, borrowed 2280 from First Franklin Financial Corporation on 62001 for Lisa Boozer, in which she, Lisa, agrees to pay $100 on the 20th of every month until the balance is paid in full. And you signed that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, how much did you give her back? Judge Judy, first of all, it was five fraudulent checks, okay? The total came up to $830. I have the receipts right here where I paid them. I had $100 of my own money. My mother gave me $30. Regina only gave me $700. I'd never seen none of the agreement that she signed with the um, loan company or any, any of that. You signed this piece of paper. Because she said she needed, uh, she was going to get her bills consolidated. And that she needed to let them know that she was not paying that back, that I was the one that would needed to pay that back, not her. Me and her split it that. She needed money for school to pay school off to get her, um, her grades. She gave me 700 and she kept the rest of it. Well, how am I supposed to tell that from this note that you signed? How am I supposed to tell that? I mean, are you an unintelligent girl? No, I am not. Well, me and Regina you're not... both went to college together, Just and she second. knows this. If you went to college yes, together, so you're a... so you are clearly an intelligent young woman. This is a promissory note for twenty-two hundred and eighty dollars, where you promise to pay back one hundred dollars a month. Now, I don't doubt that that scenario could have happened. Yes, ma'am. I mean, you're an intelligent young woman. Why would you sign something like this? Because we were friends, and she said she needed the money for her new baby to get her bills consolidated <laughs> so she wouldn't be in a bind. Very possible. Yeah. Now, you paid her back some. Let me see the receipts of what you paid her. I never got any receipts. I gave Regina cash. My sister was with me every time I, I paid her. I have all the receipts. She has made three payments. You never gave me a receipt. I, there, you never. Because you never paid You me. never gave you me never no paid receipt. It. I paid. Well, you gave the receipt to Don't strike with you. Listen to me. Don't your... fight with each other. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have a receipt. Shh, don't fight with each other. Don't speak she to each other. She wouldn't have a don't receipt. Um, speak. Just Judy, because she never went and paid the loan. I had to go and track her down every 20th of the month, 25th, and go and make the payments myself, go to this place. How many payments times. did she make? She made three. Of $300? She made three payments, of three, so that's $300, and I've been making them ever since. Can my sister please speak just here? Sure. Yes. Come on, please. <laughs> Go ahead. They made the transaction at my house, and it was $700 that Regina counted out to my sister at my house. Then we went and we paid on the checks. Me, my mom, and my sister went and paid on the checks. And I was with Lisa on a couple occasions when she did make the payments to Regina. Regina came over to my house to get the payment. Um, the young lady that's with her now, she don't even know where I stay. I, I never met her. It's my first time ever meeting her. And uh, we went up to the hospital to also give uh, Regina some, pay uh, some money, too. So, I have a piece of paper here. It is a contract. It says, I will pay back this amount of money. If there was a side contract that it wasn't going to be that much money, and, it, and I'm not doubting that it's possible that that happened, but I'm not dealing with an unintelligent young woman here. You're right. I'm dealing with an intelligent young woman. You have a contract. You agreed. It was notarized. You went in to somebody actually to have it notarized. The signature's notarized. So you were aware that this was a binding sort of contract. You know, Judge Judy, you know, it's ironic that this would come up after Regina was under investigation at Spomer Regional Medical Center <laughs> for going into her baby's, uh, new baby's father, new girlfriend's files. And I told her, me and her went to college together, and we went through too much to get to where we was at. And if they ever came to me and asked me, was she the one that went in her, uh, in her files and, they and would see that found you out? Pulled up her. All no, right, listen, I'm not... No, ma'am. Hey, no, ma'am. No, ma no, ma you know you did. Miss <laughs> Boozer, Miss Boozer. Yes, ma'am. She's ma saying she don't have... Listen to me. I don't have S6. One, She's two, saying... three. And you're out of here. I'm not a young person anymore. I don't like to shout. You borrowed this money in June. Yes, ma'am. And the interest was substantial. And according to you, and even according to your witness, you made no more than three payments on the $700, because that's all she's prepared to testify to. Why didn't you pay the rest? Why? No, no, don't make up a story. Why I didn't you pay I the rest? I paid her the rest. I made, the last so, payment I gave her was January, when I received the, um, the court papers. When you paid her in January, did you get a receipt? No. Then I don't believe you. And I'm going to tell I you why. Her... Then I'm going to tell you why. Did you pay her by check? No. Then I'm going to tell you why. Because unless you are really thick, somebody sues you, and you want to make your final payment, 
And you say that I won't owe you anything, even though the amount that she was suing you for was different. If you give her the money, you at least say, at least this time, I'm going to do it by a money order so that I have a record. I'm going to do it with a receipt so I have a record. I'll do it by check so I have a record. But you don't just go and hand the money in cash. So I don't believe you. Judgment for the plaintiff in the amount requested in the amount of $1,700. That's all. Parties are excused. You may step out. I think that, you know, she need to go get a life she and find uh, her child. baby's father. She never was my friend. And when she get back home, she will be picked up because she wrote another check in December. She goes into her um, ex-boyfriend's, new girlfriend's <laughs> files and finds that she has breast cancer. And was going around, goes around Spottenberg and tell everybody. Stay away from this one. And now the next case. All parties in the matter of Oakley versus Graham. Step forward, please. 50-year-old construction worker Mike Oakley is suing 44-year-old contractor Hans Graham for running him off the road and assaulting him in a fit of road rage. Hans claims Mike started it. All right, you two gentlemen were in your cars. You don't know each other. And there was an incident that looked to me like a little bit of road rage. Mr. Oakley, you claimed that the defendant caused damage to your car. Yes. You want to tell me first when this happened? This happened November 9th, 6.20 a.m. Where were you going or coming from, sir? I was going to work up uh, I-15 out of San Diego. Was it light or dark out? It was just getting light. What kind of car were you driving? A 2002 Toyota truck. Okay, tell me what happened. I was in the second lane, which is right next to the fast lane, which I traveled that lane. How many lanes are there altogether? There was six. Go ahead. We were just going along and... Uh, Who was got, with you? Uh, Donnie is my... He works for our company, too. He's a carpooler. He rides with me. Okay. Um, driving along and uh, we got slow traffic in the second lane. It was down to about 60 miles an hour and I signaled, moved over into the fast lane. Before I knew it, Mr. Graham was on my rear end and uh, he went to go around me in the second lane. He went past me and cut back into the first lane and that's where he clipped me and knocked me out of control. I went left, I went right, I went left again and got it under control. I pulled off the road because I couldn't go to the right, there were so many lanes. I pulled off, he had pulled off in front of me about 30, 40 feet. Got out of my truck, as soon as I shut my door, Mr. Graham was right on top of me saying that he was going to kick my And he pushed me and I fell over to the little wall that's in between the freeways. I got back up, went to the back of my truck, reached in for a hammer because I didn't know what this guy was going to do next. He came down the side of the truck, stopped there, he went towards the window and asked Donnie if he would like a little bit of this too and he punched the window. The window didn't break and after that he went, he came back again and he stopped and went back to his truck. He uh, wrote down some information I guess and he threw the information at me, said I had to go to work and he left the scene. Let me see the police report, please. Mm -hmm. What is that piece of cardboard that you have, sir? That's uh, uh, showing the where, how the accident happened. This is Mr. Graham. Or this is me, and this is Mr. Graham. He came up behind us. I guess this is the wrong way. There we go. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, he was in the one lane. You're the red car. <laughs> Listen to me. In the way no, you I'm have not that the diagram. I'm really the, I'm in the second lane here. I moved over, and when he went around... I said, you're yes, the red yes, car. Yes, you're absolutely right. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, you're the so, red car. <laughs> okay, so I moved over into this lane. Okay, and probably See, what you did was you cut him off. Is that right, Mr. Graham? Yes, ma'am. You cut him off, and I you got, got angry. Yes. So he went around you... Went around me. ...to get back in front of you to cut you off. Yes, and he clipped my front end. No, ma'am. Okay, well, I'm going to get to you in a second. Thank you. Can I see... What kind of damage was done to your truck, please? Mm -hmm. I have the pictures here. It's kind of hard to see because of the light. And here's the estimate for the damage. What kind of deductible do you have, sir? A thousand dollar. Okay. Now, Mr. Graham, I'll hear you, sir. Um, is that the amended police report? Because there was actually two, and I never got the amended one. This was the first one filed. Hey, he left out a couple key facts there. He cut me off, straight off, underneath, couldn't even see his lights. I couldn't even hit my brakes. I went around him and actually kept my tires still in this lane here. 
When we went up here, I was not concentrating on him. There was another car beside me. I was holding on to my steering wheel, watching this car here. Boom, all of a sudden we make contact. I look back to see him lose control of his vehicle. Mr. Graham, why did you attempt to get back into the I UFO? didn't. I, I stayed straight. I stayed. I, I went around him. When he made the lane change, he actually went too far over. I mean, he came in front of me quick, and he knows it. He knows he cut me off. You ask him point he, blank. He Mr. cut Graham, me that off. May, that may ha have happened, sir. Okay. I, I didn't oh, even no. see his lights. Oh, listen to me. That may have happened, sir. Let's say he didn't look before okay. he put on his signal. Now, I have, in fact, in my lifetime, seen some drivers. They do the following. They put on their signal, then they change lanes, and then they look. And I'll say to him, no, you got the order wrong. The order is you put on your blinker, then you look. If it's clear, then you change lanes. That's not what he did. He went, Okay. So, Mr. Gray, <clears throat> do you think that he did that because he wanted to get into an accident or because he just wasn't thinking? He wasn't thinking. Right. Just okay. stop right there. So if somebody's not thinking, I mean, this certainly wasn't a nut, just wasn't thinking. And I've seen that. I'm sure that most of us have been in that situation where, you know, you're thinking about something else and you want to change a lane or you're getting on a highway and, you know, you're looking in one direction, you get on the parkway, and all of a sudden you see a car. It comes out of nowhere. That's what causes accidents. But why did you get so angry? Well... You got at Mr. Graham. Not yet. Can, can, I, can I finish? You told me you yeah. let me have my chance to talk. You got angry because okay. he cut you off. No, I didn't. Everything happened so quick, I had to get by him. I had another car here. I got angry when we got out of the truck, and that's where he left out more key parts. I, he's, we weren't 30 feet apart. Our truck, our truck was 10 feet apart. I walked to the back of my truck. He threw his door open, got out, threw his hands up, and said, why didn't you let me in? And when he took a step towards me, I stepped towards him. He wasn't going to hit me, so I pushed him. He fell no, down. No, 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 Mr. Graham. Listen to me, sir. I read your answer very carefully. You said when he got out of the truck, he said to you, why didn't you let me in? And then you wrote, I pushed him. No, he threw his hands up. I'm so telling you, he, he threw, threw his, his hands, hands up. So he threw his hands up. You said, so I pushed him. And then you say, he jumped back up, which means you pushed him hard enough to knock him down. Yes, ma'am. He fell down. So when I say to you, Mr. Graham, that you were angry, you can't say to me I wasn't angry. Oh, no. You were angry. I was angry when I got out of the truck, yes, ma'am. You ma were angry before you got out of the truck. No, ma'am. Well, I think you were. Well, I, I didn't have time. It happened like one, two, three. And then he jumped up and he got to, went to his window that I hit and he told his buddy, are you going to get out of the truck or what? And that's when I, I said, yeah, come on, hit just him, get out of the truck. Mr. Graham, why did you, shh, just a second. You just said you went over to his buddy where you had just hit the window. Why did you hit his window? No, he went to his buddy. No, no, no. You said to me, I just hit the window. I did. You said to me, I hit the yes, window. Yes, ma'am. But he, why but see, you, before... Why did you hit his window? I'm t talking to his buddy. Go ahead, get out of the truck. Come on. Get out of the truck. You were out of control. No. You were out of control. He may have done the wrong thing by cutting you off. And if he got out of the car and said, why didn't you let me in? And maybe it's possible that... It's not as I had originally thought that he just wasn't looking, but that he wanted to get over and maybe you weren't letting him in and he went over anyway. That's a possibility. But my sense of what happened here is you totally overreacted to a situation. It's incorrect, Your Honor. Where were you going to, Mr. I was Gray? going to work. I was going to um, a job where I uh, install a marble and granite yeah. and I had a marble delivery there I had to sign for. I was yeah. not out of control. If I would have been out of control, I would have thumped him. You were out of control, sir, because you put your hands on him first and then he you went over to... He towards me with Shh. his hands in the air. No. He yes, would... ma'am, he did. No. I don't believe that, sir. <laughs> okay. I don't believe that he stepped towards you with his hands in the air in a combative position. If he did, I'm telling you, based upon your posture here today, you would have hit him, not pushed him. And then after that happened, I you went over to his friend. I'm speaking. You I'm went sorry. over to his friend who was in the passenger seat and you banged on the window. No, but Bourbon McDaniel is suing her daughter, Glenda Julius, for the cost of her granddaughter's funeral. Glenda says her mother is heartless. Miss McDaniel, the defendant is your daughter. Yes, ma'am. Your complaint is really a simple one. And your complaint is that you made two loans to your daughter. Yes, ma'am. And she has not paid you back. Your daughter says that these were not loans. They were really gifts. But the matter becomes more complicated. 
because of the nature of the loans that you claim to your daughter. Miss Julius, you had a daughter who was murdered. Yes, ma'am. When was she murdered? September 24th. She was found dead in her room. In your home? In our home. Has the perpetrator of that murder ever been found? There are three people apprehended as of right now for first degree murder. How old was your daughter? According to you, Ms. McDaniel, you went to where your daughter was living and your daughter did not have money for a burial. That's right. You agreed to loan her the money for the burial. Yes, ma'am. Subsequently, your daughter, who was not happy staying in the same house where her daughter was murdered, which is quite understandable because the people had not been apprehended at that time, asked if she could relocate. And you agreed to loan her some money. Yes, ma'am. So that she could relocate. What was the extent of those two sums of money? The funeral was how much? $4,582.27. And how much did you advance your daughter to relocate? $1,487.68. The matter becomes more complicated because at some point, Ms. Julius, you ascertained that there was a crime victim's compensation that you could apply for. The DA. The DA. From, from Carroll County. Told you what? Told me that there was a victim's fund relief. And what was it for? It was for expenses for Jessica's death. And I have been making payments. Just a second. Expenses for Jessica's death. Yes. Which included her burial. Which my mother gave as a gift. Listen to me very carefully. Which included, yes. So the state of Tennessee had a fund which provided for the survivors of victims of violent crime to give them money so that they could pay for burial? Yes. And other related expenses? Yes. You applied for that? Yes. And you got a check? Yes. How much was the check? One was 5300 and the other one was 1000 24. Can I see the paperwork surrounding yes. those two checks, please? There was a few gas expenses. Can I see the paperwork for the... This is exactly what Bird, I'll issued, take a look but at I have more different... Uh, I have receipts to where I have been paying my mother. Just a second. They paid you $5,307.27 for the funeral. And then there are other related expenses, moving expenses. Are you telling me that you have proof that you gave some of this money to your mother? Yes, I have. I'd like to see it, please. I have receipts. Here, here this is it for money orders. She told me that her payments were 70 and 40. I talked to my sister, Gail, that's standing next to her over the telephone. She was in California. I talked to her, and she said, have you been given her money? I said, yeah. She told me 70 and 40 on her credit cards. And that's exactly, I've been giving her a little bit more. Well, I see what you're talking about. You've been, you gave her $30. Forty dollars, and it started on eleven three. Excuse me. I understand that, but these are very small amounts of money. When did you get the check from the state? In April. She told me it was on credit cards, and as long as I was helping her out, there was no lump sum that I was supposed to give her. She knew I would have to go home. I have a headstone to purchase for my daughter, which is nine hundred and ten dollars, and I'm working at a minimum wage job. I moved out because it was so unbearable to live with her in her house. Let's go back a second. You got this money, which is 60, about $6,500. What did you do with it? I've been living on it. And also, I have money set aside to buy Jessica's stone and money set aside to go home. Well, because so I you cannot just, you live... Just told, just a second. You just told me that the stone is $900. $910. Fine. And did you order it? I've already talked to... That, 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 yes. that, don't play with yes. Did you pay for it? Not as of yet. Why not? Because she started this lawsuit. What's the name of the company that's going to do the stone? M uh, Memorial Gardens. Well, you certainly have $900 for the stone because you got $6,500. And my problem with you, Ms. Julius, is because this is not a very difficult case, whether your mother said to you, as you allege in your answer, it's the least I can do to give you the money for the funeral, right? That's what she alleges you said to her, or not. 
the good people of the state of Tennessee did not provide this money for you to live on. There were the good people of the state of Tennessee wanted to ensure that your daughter had an appropriate burial. So you cannot take their money and do what you want with it. You have to take their money and pay for her funeral. That's what it was earmarked for by the state. Because whether you and your mother, according to you, you colluded to defraud the state by her signing papers that said she's going to pay me back and she really didn't mean that you were going to pay her back, that's a fraud on the state. I can't sanction that. Do you understand that? Yes, ma'am. What kind of work do you do? I'm working in a dry cleaners. What I'm having trouble dealing with the public. What kind of work did you do before your daughter's death? I was working in a convenience store, third shift. Your mother paid for the funeral, according to the claim that you put into the criminal injuries compensation claim for Jessica Dawn Julius. The funeral was five thousand three hundred seven dollars and twenty seven cents. That's what you told the state, correct? Yes, ma'am. And the funeral was actually forty five eighty two. The difference was donations from the school where Jessica went. What? I have a paper that states each and every one that gave donation to funeral. Can I see it, please? Yes. The family that Jessica was, Lisa Stevens' family, were there and willing, and the whole town was willing to help out with this. My mother is the one that wanted me to move. I, I left I'm everything I owned. I'm not talking about this to me. I'm not talking about the moving. I'm talking about the fact that you cannot take this money and live on it. I have to make a judgment whether the person who actually paid for the funeral, and that's your mother, or you who did not pay for the funeral, are the rightful recipients of this money from the state, which is earmarked for your daughter's burial expenses. Do you understand that? Yes, ma'am. And there were some very nice people from the town who also sent checks in for the funeral. But that's not the issue. The issue really is a very simple one. Whether your mother, at the time that your daughter died, and I believe that she probably did, say to you, this is a terrible time, I don't want you to worry about the funeral, I'll take care of it, because that's what a parent does. But then when you found out that there was a possibility, because you said that the district attorney told you that there was a fund, that was after your daughter was buried, correct? Yes. So after your mother laid out that money and probably would not have sought to recoup it because you have limited circumstances, that'd be a fair statement. But after she found out that you were going to get this money from the state for the funeral, the right thing for you to do was to give it back to her. I've been giving her uh, uh, no, close no, to fifteen hundred no, 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 dollars. No, 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 no. That so may far. have been fine, Miss Julius, giving her thirty bucks giving us $70 until you got $6,500. Once you got $6,500, you had to say, Mom, clean up the credit card, pay it off, because that's what this check was supposed to be used for. Yes, we understand each other? Yes, ma'am. Good. Let's not pursue this any further. Your family has had sufficient amount of sadness to last for a lifetime. So you have the money, and even if your mother is awarded the $5,000, you still have money left over for the headstone, and then some, right? Good. Judgment for the plaintiff in the amount of $5,000. That's all. Thank you, Your Honor. Parties are excused. You may step out. Cheryl Wells says her estranged son-in-law, Richard Sharp, owes for half the cost of his wedding. Richard claims he'd to pay. What is all that stuff? This is stuff that um, I brought that I don't have um, actual receipts for just to show you that. What is it? It's a can the Unity candle, some... Um, Table decorations that we made, the candle right. stands. Bert, could you do me a favor? Could we get rid of that? I don't need all that stuff here. Where do you want me to put it? I put it on the floor. Okay. Thank you. Ma'am, take this stuff and put it on the floor, please. Thank you. Perfect. Ms. Wells, this is what the case is about. Mr. Sharp is your soon to be ex son in law. He and your daughter had a very short and unpleasant marriage, and it is your claim that he had agreed to pay for half the wedding. The loan lasted longer than the wedding. Correct. Now they're going to get a divorce, and you want half the cost of the wedding, which was, you say his half was $7,000? Correct. Mr. Sharp said, listen, I never agreed to pay for a big wedding. So, Mr. Sharp, this, I assume, is your soon-to-be ex-wife? Yes, ma'am. How long were the two of you dating before you decided to get married? Four months, Your Honor. What? Four months. And whose brilliant idea was it to get married? Mine, Your Honor. Could you speak Mine. up a little bit? I'm old. I have... Mine. 
Mine. Did you give her a ring? <clears throat> yes. How much did you pay for it? I want to say about 200 and maybe 34 bucks, 40 bucks. What kind of work do you do? I work for Sun Cruise Casino and a gambling boat. And how much do you earn a week? I make eight, but I bring home like seven. Seven? I, 700. A week? Every two weeks. Okay. When your daughter came home and showed you the engagement ring and told you that Mr. Sharp had asked her to marry him, what did you think? I didn't approve of it. I didn't like it because they didn't know each other that long. But... Well, that's a good judgment on your part. When you saw the engagement ring that he bought your daughter, what did you think of it? I didn't have any thoughts. I mean, I did thought... Did you think that he wanted to get her the best he... possible engagement ring he that could? He possibly could listen, listen to me. Did you think that he wanted to get her the best possible engagement ring he could afford? Yes, I did. And he spent $230 on the engagement ring, which was the best he could afford. Right? That's what you thought. I didn't know how much it cost him. But it wasn't. I mean, we're not talking about the Hope Diamond here. No. Now, who wanted the big wedding? Richard did. Did you? Yes. Why? At the time, I was in love with her. And after we got married, Phil... Listen to me, Richard. You didn't take any snoozy pills this morning, did you? No, ma'am. I want you to listen to the question. Your mother-in-law says you were the one who wanted the big wedding. Is that true? Yes. Who was supposed to pay for it? She was. Your Honor, shh. Why was she supposed to pay for a big wedding if you wanted it? So I Do you want to take a nap? No. <laughs> Who is this? My stepfather. Step up here with him. Tell me your name. Frank, Your Honor. Frank what? Enoch. Mr. Enoch, do you understand my question? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Miss Wells wants your stepson to reimburse her for half the wedding. Ordinarily, I would say, listen, that's ridiculous. Usually, it is the bride's family's responsibility to pay for the wedding. Your Honor. I'm speaking. My father and mother paid for my first wedding. They paid for my second wedding. <laughs> and then my father said, the next one's on you. <laughs> You see, I'm having trouble communicating with your stepson, sir, because I'm not quite getting the fact that he's wrapped he's too tight. He's nervous, that's all. He doesn't look nervous, Mr. Enoch. He looks tired. Are you nervous? Not really. I can try harder. I don't think you'll be able to make me nervous. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying to you, Mr. Enoch? I understand what you're saying. That. So Miss Wells says he's the one who wanted the big wedding. I don't know why. It's usually the bride that wants the big wedding. You didn't want a big wedding? No, ma'am. Step up here with your mother. Why did he want a big wedding? He had a whole bunch of friends? Um, when he was working at the car lot, he was inviting people he didn't even know that would come and make a payment to, to our wedding. I want you to tell me what happened when you started to discuss the cost of it. Uh, we sat down, and I, me and my mother explained to him, we don't have this kind of money. We don't even know these people. If it was, you know, if it was some people he knew, then fine, but he didn't know these people. So what did he say? He said, well, I think they should come anyway, and I'll pay for half the wedding, since it's mostly my people that I want to come. Is that what you said? No, ma'am. How many people were at the wedding, Mr. Sharp? There was about 120, 140. How many people were at the wedding? 73. Of the 73 guests, how many were his family and friends, and how many yours? Uh, 60 of them was his. You mean you had 13? Yeah, because we not from Shh. Florida. 60 were his family and friends. Yes and 13 were your family. Is that right? Correct. Is that correct? No, ma'am. How many were your family and friends? There was, my family was five, and there was maybe like three or four friends of mine. <laughs> your Honor, I have the wedding pictures. I also have the kind of people that you're dealing with. This, this is public record. I don't need to see the kind of people that I'm dealing with. I just have to try to figure out whose responsibility is to pay for this fiasco. Fiasco is correct. What are these pictures? Now, let me take a look at the wedding pictures. Miss Wells, is this your only child? This is my only daughter, yes. This is your only daughter? Yes. You should go around the desk praying three times, get down, kiss the floor, and say, thank God she got out when she did. You're correct. I, I agree. Because you don't have any children with him, do you? No, ma'am. But for the grace of God, you could have had a grandchild fathered by this guy. No, thank you. I agree with no, you. No, thank you. Really. Unless, he's no, hiding, thank you. unless he's hiding something from me that I don't see. Well, you're not missing much. Okay. Who's in this picture? Can you see it from there? Yes. 
Who was in this picture? That's me, Jack, Bill, Terry. Who are they? Friends of mine. Friends of yours? And the one guy, Jack, Just I used second. to work for him. You said three or four, so that these are the only people at the wedding that were your friends? <laughs> there might be a little bit more, but other than that. Who are these people? That's my stepbrother, and that's her stepfather. Okay, so you got a stepbrother here. Yes. Was he in this picture, too? No, ma'am. These people come with their significant others, or they come stag? They came with others. With others? They came with their So with you got to do this times two, right? Yes, ma'am. That's more than three. Even you could tell that, right? Yes, ma'am. Madam, it's clear to me that he had certainly more than three or four people at the wedding. <laughs> so what you're telling me is he said to you, these are the people that I want at the wedding. They're friends that I work with. Not friends that he works with, but he was working at a car lot, and people that would come in to make their payments that he would talk to just to make their payments, he would invite to our wedding that he did not know. Your Honor, I had to finally put a stop to it because this list was like 300 people. Who was supposed to pay for all these people, all these strangers? I felt that I was, I was going to pay for them, but as soon as she said she put a stop to it, I said, okay, never mind then. Oh, oh, oh. All right. Now, where were they married? At the Ramada Inn. Had you taken the Ramada Inn before or after you had this discussion with him about inviting too many people to the wedding? I had already talked to the Ramada Inn, and then when he kept adding the... the... No, I want you to make sure you give me the honest answer. You had gone to the Ramada Inn, you have to give them a deposit right. and reserve the date. Correct. Had you done that before you had the discussion with him? Yes, but he kept um, adding to the list. I, I, you don't have to repeat it. I understand what you're saying to me. So you had already taken the hall, and initially, he was not going to pay for half the wedding. That's according to what I'm gathering now. It was not until after he started adding all these people. No, Your Honor, that's not correct. He agreed to pay for half the wedding. No, no correct, we went Your to Honor. the. I was there when it was discussed. No, I don't believe that, Miss Wells. But that is Listen not to me. No. Miss Wells, I don't believe that. I don't it's believe that somebody who buys a $230 engagement ring makes a knowing no. decision to pay for half the wedding that, according to you, cost $14,000. I wanted them to elope. I offered to give them $2,000 so I didn't have to pay for this big wedding. He, yeah. no. he had already Shh. agreed to, say, to. Now you want to talk to me? Yeah. Good. Now I'll hear you. But make sure you're telling me in a loud, clear voice. I, I did not agree to pay for half of this wedding, Your Honor. Well, tell me what happened. What happened is I, I started adding people to the list, and she said, no, I, don't, I can't afford all these people to come, Your Honor. So I said, okay, well, we'll stop all them people, because who even knows if half of them people are going to show up? Your Honor, that's not right, because I even paid for his probation. He was supposed to pay me that back as well, and he has not even done that. And her daughter paid her back out of that for, with her income tax money, Your Honor. Just a second. So what you're telling me is you were on probation, you had certain fines? Yes, ma'am. And she paid your fines? With her income tax. Because you didn't have the money? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So how could you reasonably expect him to pay $7,000 for a wedding when he couldn't even pay his own probation fine? We paid his probation off so he could get off by the beginning of February for our wedding. You working? Yes. Pay your mother back for this wedding. No way. Pay your mother back for this wedding. I've paid her half of the wedding already. I don't believe that he agreed to pay you for half the wedding. He didn't, Your Honor. No, I don't believe that. Your Honor, he did agree to pay for that wedding. Do you have that in writing someplace? I don't have papers have... for that. You should. You're dealing with well, somebody no. who is a convicted felon. It would seem to me if someone agreed to Your pay. Your Honor, he I'm goes speaking. to every son... I'm speaking. I have to come up in my mind, if he agreed to pay you, which I doubt, but let's say he said, I'll pay for half the wedding. Any legitimate and reasonable expectation that this person who spent $200 for an engagement ring and couldn't pay his probation fines was going to be able to pay for a $14,000 wedding. What was the nature of the felony that you were convicted of? Sales and possession. Sale and possession of what? Cocaine. How many times? Twice. Two different arrests? Yes. That means you got caught twice. Yes. That doesn't mean that you sold only twice. It means you got caught twice. I got caught twice. Well, then you are smart. Yes, ma'am. Pretty smart. Well, you... not, not pretty smart for selling drugs. But you were pretty smart. You did it a few times and you didn't get caught, right? I should have done it at all. I asked you a question. Just a Yes. Just a second. Yes. Don't tell him what to say, Mr. Renock. I think he understands me pretty well, sir. I think he's keeping his cool because I don't think that with this kind of act, this young woman would have said yes to this proposal. Your Honor, can I say something? Please. Go ahead. 
He goes to church every Sunday. We thought that he was reformed. I mean, you're supposed to give everybody a chance. And that's exactly what we did. We believed him. And the reason that the wedding wasn't, it is because he moved in with his girlfriend that he had before oh, we no, were married. No, no, no. Yeah, honey, this lady, my soon-to-be ex-wife, she thinks I am sleeping with this girl. Melissa, okay? Me and Melissa ain't together. Ma'am. She, she would not sleep with me because I am married to this young lady here. And I got to respect so that So you've asked her to? That. Listen to me. I just wanted to hear him talk because uh, so far I've had monosyllabic conversations with him and I wanted to make sure that he was more together than he was presenting. I'm speaking. More together than he was presenting to me a moment ago. I do not believe that he agreed to pay for half the wedding. It's unfortunate. And my advice to everyone out there is don't spend an awful lot of money on first weddings. Wait for the second one. They usually hold out a little bit better. Your Honor, he's sorry, Ms. Willie. So I don't believe it. That's all. All these are excused. You may step out. Eugene Tomda says the mother of his children, Amanda Petrie, owes for a loan to move out of his house. Amanda claims Eugene put her out of the home when she was eight and a half months pregnant. Mr. Tonda, you and Miss Petrie have two children together. You've never been married. Is that right? Yes, Your Honor. How old are your children? Uh, four and uh, two and a half, almost three. And in what state did you live? Uh, Minnesota. Where do you live now? I live in Texas. That's where I'm from. Where do you live now? I still reside in Minnesota. Your complaint, Mr. Tonda, alleges a loan to the defendant, which she was paying for several years. And then when she left Minnesota with your children and moved to Texas, she stopped paying the loan. You want her to continue paying the loan? Correct. Miss Petrie says that she was coerced forced into signing a paper or agreeing to repay this money. It was never intended to be a loan. And now that she's in Texas, she's not paying you another dime. Let's see. When did you make this loan and what was it for, sir? Um, I originally took out the loan, Your Honor, in March of 2004. It was to get Amanda into an apartment of her own. Um, she was living with me, but we were not together at the time. Uh, she had just moved back from North Carolina. Uh, where she had uh, relocated to go live with her sister for a while. And she took your child with her? Uh, yeah, at the time we had just our son, Gino. Were you happy about her going to live with her sister? Uh, no, not at all. Actually, his exact words were, I don't care. My sister was standing next to me. He wasn't involved. He wasn't paying child support. Well, he must have been together with him at some point if your sister was in the room when he said, I don't I care. went and told him and she came with me. No. You told him what? That I was thinking of moving to North Carolina, that he and I didn't get along. He was verbally and emotionally abusive and it wasn't good for me and it wasn't good for our son. He wasn't paying support at the time and that I needed a, a fresh start. And he said? And he said, I don't care, whatever. Actually, Your Honor, that's not true at all. I was paying support to her directly. And the, uh, the manner of which she um, broke this news to me was we were actually at a bowling alley and she had got uh, furious about some silly thing and then said, well, I'm, I'm moving to North Carolina. I'm just picked up and walked away and it wasn't like a calm cool collective. She was it in the bowling alley thing. that you told him this? I did tell him. Uh, fine. Got it. Okay. Then you went to North Carolina. That didn't yes. work out. You and he came. wasn't paying child support. I <laughs> moved back to Minnesota at what point? I moved back at the end of November of 03. He convinced me to move back. We had found out um, I was pregnant with our daughter now and I wasn't going to move back and he convinced me to move back that he had made mistakes and he was going to be more involved and then a week after we moved back he had decided that living in his house was too much of a family union and we just argued all the time and then in March of 04, three weeks before I was due with our daughter, he kicked us out. He didn't take the loan out to help me. I wasn't searching for an apartment. I had no job at the time. I was due in three weeks. He took it out, didn't discuss it with me, had no idea, and said, you need to get out of my house. I let him know, I don't have a job. I'm due in three weeks. Where do you expect us to go? And he said, well, I took out a loan. So I didn't know about it. I've never signed gotcha. anything. Okay, let's go. Um, that, again, not the case. I, we had discussed it before. We were not together at the time. Yeah, she was living with me. I, at the time, had still pr originally purchased this house with a friend. So there was a, a couple roommates there, and it wasn't an environment for, you know, two kids. There was, you know, two other, you know, mid-20-year-old men living there. So I let her live there as an accommodation until we could find something. So you were living with him in a house with other adult males. They lived in the basement, yes. With other adult males? Yes. Did you share a room with him? Yes. In that house? Yes. Okay, so you're sharing a bedroom? Correct. So far, you're losing my sympathy, Mr. Tonda. Well, it was an unfortunate circumstance. I mean, we had to do what we had to do, and that's why 
you know, I didn't kick her out. You know, I brought up a proposition that I felt would be beneficial for both of us to get her into a play room before our daughter was born. Why? Who was going to be there to help her? Who's going to be there to help her? That's my well, question. Well, we had moved, we had gotten a, a place, you know, 15, 20 minutes away from my house, so. That's we, 15 or 20 minutes. She's expecting a baby. She's living in Minnesota. I assume she has no family in Minnesota. She didn't, she did not have any family, per se, Listen but my me. family had she taken had no, is, is like her She own. had no family in Minnesota. She's due in three weeks. Your child. Yep. So it would seem to me you'd want to keep her around at least until she's back up on her feet after the baby is born. It doesn't seem like the appropriate time to find her a new space, Mr. Tonda. Well, I thought it was more appropriate before the baby was born than after. You're wrong. So. It was selfish and babyish. I disagree. I don't give a rat's tutu whether you agree or disagree, sir. You want me to take a poll as to whether or not most mature adult males would say it was appropriate to find an eight and a half month pregnant woman who's got a one year old, a place of her own in a town where she has no family, sir? You want me to take a poll? No, I'm you don't want to. You don't want a poll there, sir. Believe me. I don't think it's necessary. Believe me, you don't want a poll. It was a selfish thing to do. So you took out a loan. You got her an apartment, Correct. right? Well, you didn't expect her to pay the rent, did you? Well, not right away. How is she right supposed away. to pay the rent? Eight and a half months pregnant. Well, not right away, but that's that's well, why when? we that's let's, why we took off the loan when, when she started working. Let's see when. When she started working. Well, when did you think she was going to start working? I would assume roughly six to eight weeks after her daughter was born. Right. And just a second. And what was she? And what was she supposed to do with a six-week-old baby and a one-year-old baby? What was she supposed to do with those? Well, it's not like she was just on her own. I mean, obviously, I was an active parent involved in paying support, so she had the support that, that I second. was paying her. Just a second. That's not being an active parent. I don't understand. What's not being an active parent? Giving money is not an active parent. No, that was to help the situation. It wasn't. I'm not defining being an active parent by taking out a loan. Well, what did you do when she got this apartment by herself? Did you go over there every day? I was over there quite a bit, did actually. You, that's not my question. Did you go over there every day to take care of your son? Well, I wouldn't say every day. Well, what did daycare. you expect her to do with the baby and a new baby when you weren't there? What did you expect her to do? Your Honor, it's in a circumstance where, we, unfortunately, we weren't together and it didn't work out. But I felt I did what I could to help her out. And, you know, my so family So then what are you doing here? My question to you, sir, is what are you doing here? You took out a loan to get her an apartment so she could be on her own after impregnating her twice. Well, I'm here to, it was, a loan is the key word. She agreed to pay and she faithfully paid on it for two years on the loan. And then once I filed for custody of my children because she picked up and moved to Texas with well, five days Well, that was a bad notice. thing for her to do to pick up and move to Texas if you were a good and involved father. Because she has only her best interest in mind, not the, not the interest of the children, hence well, the reason let me that ask, I filed for custody. And you only have have the best interests of the children in mind. Actually, I do, Your Honor. Then what are you doing here? How much support were you paying two years ago? When we had just our son born, I was giving her about four hundred dollars a month. Four hundred dollars a month. A month. That's what you Okay. I was giving her two hundred dollars every two weeks. And what do you give her now? Eight hundred dollars. Every two weeks. No, eight hundred dollars a month is what the court has ordered me to pay. Well, that's the same thing as you were paying her before for one child. Now you're giving her the same amount for two children. Right, which is double. Normally, it's only a ten percent increase for the from the first one to the second one. So I. That doesn't sound like, sir, the best interest of the children percentage. It's usually a 10% increase. Yeah, 25% of your income for the first one, and then in Minnesota it's 35%. No, so, that's not, sir, you don't get confused. Well, I know it's not Those 10%. are the minimum federal child support guidelines, which have been adapted in every jurisdiction. That's the minimum. Do you work? Yes, ma'am, and I'm in school. Who takes care of the children? They go to a child builder's Christian school. It's a private preschool. And who pays for it? I do. How much do you pay for daycare? $650 a month. Okay. So she pays $650 a month. And how much of the daycare do you pay, Mr. Tonda? I believe a portion of the total support goes to that. I don't, nothing specific. That's not what I asked you. Well, I don't pay anything directly to the... Right. So if we take away what you pay, which is $800 a month, from the $650 that she pays just to keep the children so that she can work, we have a grand total of $150 a month. I would, so I, I'm speaking. I would have, okay. I'm speaking. We're going to divide that by two equals $75 a month for each child. And that we're going to divide by 30 equals $2.50 a day.
is what you pay for each of your children in child support. May, may I speak now, Your Honor? Sure. Okay. I don't know her exact financial situation, but obviously I want to be involved to the point where I'm filing for custody of my children. And the fact is that she must not be hurting too bad because she's obviously able to afford uh, a lawyer to fly up to Minnesota to try to fight from keeping me from having the opportunity to have my kids reside in the state where I live. Mr. Tonda, why don't you listen very carefully, sir? I have tremendous, tremendous sympathy for non-custodial parents who don't see their children. And I have usually very little sympathy for custodial parents who pick up and move away and make it difficult for the non-custodial parents to see their children. Usually. But let me explain to you, sir, that in this case, Miss Petrie followed you from Wisconsin to Minnesota, where you live two times, right? Correct. And when she came back the second time, she had a baby, and it didn't work out. You say, I fulfilled my obligation because I wanted to be close to my children, paid the rent so it would be comfortable and easy for her, and gave her 200 bucks. But out of that 200 bucks, I expected her to work with two children and to pay for daycare and to pay me back my loan. Do you see why sympathy is waiting for you, Mr. Tonda? Your Honor, the state was picking up the majority of the tab of the daycare when they were in Minnesota, so the, the situation that we had in Minnesota was perfectly fine. No, it wasn't working fine. You put her out and put her in her own apartment. And what you're supposed to say, Mr. Tonda, is I'm sorry for bringing you to court. It was a stupid thing for me to do because I have found a very unsympathetic judge who doesn't find that this was a loan. The court finds that it was a very comfortable way for you to stay in your house with your two bachelor boyfriends and get rid of your responsibility that you didn't have to deal with on a regular basis, which clearly, according to your own testimony, you didn't. You weren't in her apartment every day after the baby was born, taking care of your son, taking care of your daughter. Well, maybe six out of seven You're days. At, I don't, you know. Yeah, baloney. Coming over and spending an hour is not being there to do the job a of a parent, sir. An hour. And I'm not saying that she was smart to have a second child with you. No. One mistake I can understand. Two is dumb. I agree. But it takes two to tango. It does. What I'm telling you is, right now, the mother of your two children seems to be taking care of her financial responsibilities relatively comfortably. She's got a job, she pays for daycare, and she's doing that with marginal help from you. Well, marginal. unfortunately, with her picking up and moving 1,300 miles away, where what did I can you do expect becomes her, Listen to me, sir. Where marginal. did you expect her to move to? What? You expected her to move to a jurisdiction that was closer to you where she had nobody? No, she picked up and gave me five days' notice when I'm supposed to have my kids for a, a Christmas vacation and she calls and tells me they're not coming and she's moving to Texas. Right. So That's where her family is, though. That's where her family is, right? Her mother, who she Just said second. nothing but bad things about all the whole time. Her mother and who else? Uh, her brother lives a few hours away. She's got a mother and a brother. Yep. What do you do for a living? I work for a cell phone company. Which cell phone company? Uh, Verizon Wireless. Good. They have offices in Texas. Why don't you move there? It's, uh, an Listen action. to me. That's where your family is, sir. Your two children are in Texas. Her support system is in Texas. She had a tremendous support system from my family, too. Now, her family's not your family. Right. Yeah, you uh, want to be near your children? Uh, yeah, Your Honor, can I talk Go to for Texas. a minute? When our son was being delivered and her mother had called and she was holding our son, this is how much she adores her mother. She said, oh, that's the grandma no, I of the not. phone. And we have Mr. it on videotape, Tonda, Your Honor. So Mr. Tonda, for her to say that that's an Mr. excuse to move down there and have her support system, Mr. she Tonda, doesn't barely get along with her mom. Mr. Tonda, you get along with your mother? I do get along with my mom. Ever not get along with your mother, sir? I never Did you ever not get along with I your mother? I never bad mouth my mom. Did you ever not get along? No. That's not what I asked you. Did you ever not get along of with your mother? Of course, as much as everybody probably hasn't. Okay. And I'm going to tell you something. There are a lot of curse words that go on in a labor and delivery room. A lot. I guarantee you that she called you a couple of names, too. If she didn't, she probably meant to. <laughs> Let me explain something to you, sir. You don't have a profession where you're licensed to practice only in the state of Minnesota. And if I were you and if I wanted to see my children, I would call up my boss and I would say, please find me a place in Texas so you could be a lot closer to your children if that's in your mind. But based upon what I hear, you wanted her out of the house. You took out a loan. I see no reasonable expectation for the foreseeable future of you being paid back any money from somebody who now has two babies, no job, living in a place where she has no family. I don't see any reasonable expectation of you being paid back, sir. And that's part of a contract, if it's a loan. You did the right thing if you weren't getting along and helping her get set up. Don't be a fool now, Mr. Tonda. Your case is dismissed. That's all. But it's Cynthia Aseltine and her daughter, 19-year-old Danielle Ireland are suing Cynthia's former landlord, Sydney Neese, for the return of a security deposit, moving expenses, 
and damages from an assault. All rise. Now it's case number 40 on the calendar in the matter of Azeltine, Ireland versus Nice. Parties have been sworn in, Judge. You may be seated, sir. Have a seat. Who is Miss Ireland? I'm Miss Ireland. Azeltine? Azeltine is my mother. Miss Azeltine, according to your complaint, you, not your daughter, but you, rented a room from the defendant. Yes, ma'am. And you found that room on something on the internet called Craigslist? Yes, ma'am. And signed a month to month lease? I did. When did you sign that? March 1st, 2007. Where had you been living before that? I was uh, residing in an apartment which I shared with my daughter, and she decided to move out on her own and get her own apartment. So I thought it would be um, good for me to move into a place where I could save a little money, maybe meet some new people, until I was able to purchase my own home. How long had you been renting rooms? I've been renting rooms for um, about four years. What kind of property do you have? I have a home in Elk Grove, California. How many bedrooms? Five bedrooms. How many tenants do you have? Currently one. How many tenants did you have when you had Miss Azeltine? Just myself and Cindy. And it was a month to month tenancy? It was. It is your claim that Miss Niece terminated your tenancy without proper notice. And you want moving expenses, your security deposit back, and you want damages because she, you claim, assaulted both you and your daughter. Yes, ma'am. Miss Niece says that you are not entitled to your security deposit back because you promised that you were going to stay through April, and you didn't. It is her claim that you actually assaulted her. So let's find out when the trouble began. You moved in March 1st. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. About approximately a week after I moved in, I noticed some strange behavior from Miss Niece. Um, when I was in the home alone, and especially when I had company over, um, I would notice some outbursts. Uh, it seems that she was talking to herself kind of laughing out loud. She'd walk through the home when I'd have company over and bang anything that would make noise. Opening and closing compulsively the garage door. The uh, washer was close to my room, so she'd slam the washer uh, door up and down. Um, Got it. Let's move on. Okay. And um, I became just really uncomfortable in the home. I'd find myself, I'd sign up for overtime, I'd go to the gym, anything to avoid coming home because her, her behavior was really disturbing and comfortable. And so I noticed that it, it became more obvious when I had company over, so I decided to talk to her about it. So maybe I was doing something wrong. And so I came home, and so I knocked on her door. She didn't answer, so that's when I called her cell phone, and I found that she was actually at home in her room. And uh, she came out, and I had a conversation with her, and I said, is there something bothering you, you know, lately? Um, because I've noticed that you've been slamming things around, banging things. And her response was, bang? I don't bang. Bang? I, I don't bang anything. I said, oh, okay. Well, apparently, you know, when my boyfriend's over, is that, does he make you uncomfortable? No, I don't have a problem with your boyfriend. And I said, well, one night, he spent the night here, and um, it seemed that you were really uncomfortable with that, and that's when I noticed the most noise. She goes, well, I didn't even know he spent the night. And she goes, well, it's in your lease agreement that you can't have any overnight guests. I said, well, I didn't notice that in my lease agreement. I apologize. Was it in your lease agreement? It was, ma'am, in my lease agreement. Okay. And I said, I respect that. And I said, well, that's something that I'm not sure if I can live with. I apologize. I overlooked that. And I said, if you feel real strong about that, then I, I think I might have to make a decision to, to move out. And I would go ahead and give you proper 30 day notice. And she goes, okay, well, that's fine. Fine. What day was that? That was okay, March? Okay, that was the March. I okay. sent her a copy, certified mail, which she... May I see it, please? Absolutely. That was sent to regular mail as well as certified mail, which I have a receipt there. Ms. Neeson okay. never picked up the certified copy. Okay, and you received this letter terminating yes. her tenancy. Yes, I have Fine. it right here. Good. So what happened? Okay, what so next? things were a little still uncomfortable in the house, so I decided to, to avoid her as much as possible. About a week after giving that notice to her, I came home and found that she was interviewing another tenant, which I gave her the privacy. I had went and cleaned up and got ready to go back out again. I have she, then, she, she then... Um, you have a turn. Okay. Right now, plaintiff is talking. Okay. Go ahead. After I had done finished and cleaned up and the person had left, she had uh, come and spoke with me and said, okay, well, when are you going to be moving your furniture out? I understand, you know, I received your 30-day notice. And I go, well, you know, I can start putting it in storage soon if you really need the space, because she was saying that the, she wanted to offer that space to the tenant. And she goes, well, you know, it's your right to keep it there for the remainder of the month. And, uh, you know, things seemed to be okay then, but she's still exhibiting some behaviors that I just didn't feel that... I understand. You were moving out for a reason. Keep going. Absolutely. And so I had received a phone call um, on March 31st 
I was at the gym and I received a message from this niece. And on the message, she says that she's demanding that she have a face to face meeting with me and discuss the 30 day notice agreement and, and finalize me moving out. And so I was kind of, you know, I, I didn't Just understand. Just tell me what happened. Don't okay, so I pulled her up thinking. and um, I said, I, I got your message. What's the, what's the deal with me having to come over? And she goes, Well, I want you to speak to me face to face. I gave you the same respect when you gave me your 30 day notice. And I said, Well, I really don't want to have any confrontation with you. You're making me feel really uncomfortable and threatened. She goes, Well, if you do not come home right now, I'm going to lock you out. And I said, You can't lock me out. And she goes, I'm telling you, if you don't come home right now, I'm going to lock you out. At that point, um, she disconnected the phone call. Me and my boyfriend were at the gym. I said, come on with me. She's threatening to lock me out. I need to go home. When we got there, me and my uh, boyfriend entered the home, and Miss Niece was in the kitchen. She had already taken all my groceries out of the fridge and out of the cupboard and had to set them up on the counter as if she was moving me out. I said, what are you doing? Please put my things back. You can't move me out. What, what's the problem? And at that point, she came around the counter of the kitchen with her finger in my face, and she goes, girl, you better shut your mouth because in the name of Jesus, I'm going to smack the devil out of you. At that point, my boyfriend placed his body in between us because she was this close in my face. And he's that face to me, and he's like trying to block her. And she turned around, and she swung and swung about backside of him and hit me upside the head. At that point, I grabbed my cell phone. She grabbed her cell phone. I called the police. She called 911. The police arrived, a female police officer. The police officer went and, and um, spoke to Miss Niece. Miss Niece had stated that she was going to be locking me out of the house, and the officer had stated legally, ma'am, you cannot lock her out of the house. And she goes, don't you tell me how to run my house. Can household. I see the police report, please? Yes, ma'am. Now, when did the incident happen with your daughter? Same day. Same day? It was a little bit later on that day when I had came. Um, the police officers had actually left at a certain point, and my mother had called my boyfriend and get a U-Haul to get all of her things, and um, we both ended up showing up at the exact same time as my mom with the U-Haul, and that's when I arrived. And what happened with Miss Niece? Well, we came into the house, and um, she was in her bedroom, had shut the door, and was in her bedroom, like the police officer told her to, to stay in the room. Um, I went into this little front area that was right next to her bedroom door and started to grab furniture. And I grabbed this big glass top that was to one of my mom's coffee tables, and I started going out. And then Miss Niece came out of her room and was just was really mad and angry and, and was directing a lot of anger at myself and at uh, Ryan, saying that he didn't have any right to be in the house and that was saying something about how we couldn't go through the garage door. She was telling us we had to go through the front door for some reason and I was standing on my way to the garage door she was really like livid and saying that we couldn't be in our house that we had no right to be in there and then she she comes up behind me and grabs me by the, the back of my neck and like kind of pushes me and then kind of hits me and then Miss Niece turned around to my mom and starts getting in her face and she's throwing her hands wildly and stuff and then she goes to make a fist like she was going to strike my mom and I grabbed her arm and I put it down and I said don't touch my mom and then it just turned into a scuffle where she was just being really wild. Okay, Miss Niece, yes. I would like you first to tell me your version of the events of the 31st of March. Okay, Saturday, March 31st, um, I initiated a call to Cindy to finalize things in the matter. She had sent me a letter March 20th indicating that she was going to move out at the end of April. And so I wanted to finalize things as far as obtaining the rent for April. Um, finding she already told you that mm -hmm. she was going to give you the rent April 3rd in the letter. Right. In my lease, it indicates, um, in the initial agreement that we signed, it indicates that if any rent is not paid, time or in full, that they will forfeit the security. That's in item number two in what our What difference lease. does that make? She already said, I'll pay you your rent on April 3rd. It's in her letter that she sent to you. Because I just like to do things decently and in order. So This um, is decently and in order. You called her on her cell phone. Did I, yeah, I called her on Saturday and I asked, because um, she had initiated an appointment um, in mid-March. She wanted to see if her boyfriend could stay overnight. And she knocked on my door. Actually, I was napping and she knocked oh, on my I'm door. Until Shh, don't interrupt her. I'm just asking you what you told her on March 31st. You called her, she's on at the March gym. On March 31st, I asked her if she had any time in the afternoon. I said I'd appreciate if we could finalize things and, you know, uh, get the rent. So then she started cursing at me and she started getting really violent on the phone and calling me up. Uh, Did you, you know. tell her she had to come home or else you were going to change the locks? No, absolutely not. Did you not. take her food out of the refrigerator? When she start, I'm, I'm speaking. No, I didn't actually. Did you take her food out of the refrigerator and place it on the counter? No, not. Did you tell the police? when they arrived that you were planning on changing the locks and locking her out? 
When she started cursing at me on the phone, because she, by the way, she's been pretty violent before. So um, when she came home from the gym, she came home and she kicked me, which I have a photo of the bruise on my leg from when she kicked me then. At that point, I had called the police and I, because I had wanted to have her arrested. So when they came over, they kind of separated us, got both versions of what had happened. And so I didn't have her arrested at that point. The police found you very agitated, Miss Neese. According to all three police officers who arrived at the scene... Well, she assaulted me. I have pictures. Found she, you. she admitted biting me on the arm. That was an altercation. There's no question there was an well, altercation. Well, I, I actually didn't touch her or her daughter. Both of them came home. She called her daughter, and they both came in, and then they assaulted me in my room. And that's why I had called the police a second time. When I was on the phone with the police, I was terrified. They said, where are you? I said, I locked myself in my room because I was afraid they were going to come in again. I have pictures of the door and from when they tried to barge in my door. All the bruises, they hit me. What do you do for a living, Miss Niece? I'm an insurance broker. For a company? For myself. I have my own agency. And I'm going to school for court reporting. Do you operate out of your home or out of an office? I'm usually on the road, but my office is out of my home, yes. So you don't have an office other than at your home? Correct. And how long have you been doing that? Five years. You make a living at that? Yes. The last time you had a tenant prior to the plaintiff, what was that tenant's name? Prior to Cynthia? Mm -hmm. She was the first tenant in that home. So you'd never had a tenant? Not in this home. When I was in the Bay Area, I've had tenants. She was the first tenant in this home. Judge, I have some information regarding the tenants in the Bay Area. Cynthia Aseltine and daughter Danielle Ireland are accusing Cynthia's former landlord, Sydney Neese, of two assaults. Now, I wanted to say something. Yes, San Mateo County Court, there's three claims regarding Miss Neese in regards to tenant landlord. Two times she was a defendant and one she was a plaintiff regarding the same situation, withholding deposits Can I and see so that? forth. Actually, I didn't print it out, um, but if you go to San Mateo County Court, it is public record. You had three landlord and tenant actions while you were there, one as a plaintiff and one as a defendant. I'm not sure what she's referring to, but it was just probably a lack of, you know, my income. But with regard to no, this... I'm not talking about... I'm asking you whether you had three previous landlord and tenant actions. I think there was one, and um, it was just because I was having problems, you know, with cash flow, but they have since been paid back. One was that she put a stop pay on a deposit as a tenant herself. That sound familiar? I'm not sure what she's referring to, but I would, I would appreciate if we could talk about this case today and, and why, you know, I don't believe that I owe her the security deposit. You absolutely owe her the security deposit. There's no question that you owe her the security deposit. Okay. You told her to leave. I've read the police report. You said you wanted her out that day. She left. She did not stay the month of April, despite the fact that she said she was planning on paying April's rent. You absolutely owe her the security deposit. There's no question about that. Well, because I, I had, she assaulted me, and I had to put yeah. out expense. She didn't return I believe, the key when I believe, she moved I believe, out. I believe that this was an unfortunate circumstance that everybody's tempers got very flared up. Actually, on that. mine did not. Well, not according and to the police. Uh, Miss Neese, according to the police, the only person... I was assaulted by her and her Ms. daughter. Niece. And her boyfriend had I'm to pull them you. off of me. And the police department... I'm speaking. Out, when I'm speaking, don't speak. Okay. Clearly, not only did you claim that they were assaulted, you I also... Have I'm speaking. I'm speaking. Do you hear me speaking? You mm -hmm. also claim conspiratorial yes, behavior on the part of the police. You weren't satisfied with the police officer who came. You demanded their supervisor. Two supervisors arrived. They couldn't calm you down. You demanded their supervisor. So everybody is in a conspiracy against you. There's something not right, Miss Neese. All of that is clearly contained in the police report. I assume you have a copy of it. The copy that I obtained from them does not contain that information. That's not what they had given me. They May not be what they line. gave you, but that's what I have. Okay, can I show you the um, pictures of my bruise? Absolutely. And actually, I still have them on my body. Absolutely. Show me. This is a picture of when she bit me in the arm. She absolutely acknowledges that and she then, bit you in the um, arm. And she says she bit you in my I'm breast. speaking. Don't you want to hear me speaking? She absolutely acknowledges that she bit you in the arm so that you would let her go. Absolutely, ma'am. Okay, can I tell my version of the story, ma'am? Yes, I contact do. Please, the police okay. don't. What had transpired, basically, the whole issue, it, when she first, 
In the initial ad, I indicated no alcohol, no overnight guests, and she breached both of those. She was drinking a lot while she was there, and she was having overnight guests, her boyfriend. And I never even said anything because I didn't want to get into it. But then she, like, she mentioned she talked to me that one day, and I said, no overnight guests. Are you okay with that? So she, she gave said, you notice. Yes. Listen, I got it. I have other things to do today. She said, I'm moving. She sent you an appropriate notice that she's moving. Move on with it. Get to the 31st. Right, but th then she didn't pay the rent, and so I wanted no, to... No, no, no. She has, has, has no obligation to pay the rent on March 31st. None. And if you demanded that she come home from the gym... I didn't demand that she came home. Yeah. I called her on the cell phone, and yeah. I said, do you have any oh, time yeah. this afternoon? What's your availability? I don't think you should have roommates. I don't think you should rent rooms to anybody. I don't. I think that you are a very, very nice lady who clearly should live alone, not with anybody else, because you can't make rules for adults. I mean, she's an adult lady. She's not a teenager. You didn't rent to a teenager. And if you don't like other people living in your house because other people aren't going to do things the way you do, Well, it's not that I want to do things the way I want to do. Don't. But when I rent rented, a room. They said no overnight guests. When Absolutely I rented, right. They set their and she said I did. And I honored them. Uh, you, don't and you, so you if she didn't want to. Do you take medication? <laughs> do you take medication? No, ma'am. You should. Because I've already told you four times, this is the fourth time, that when I start to speak, you have to stop. Okay. You can't. That's something that's not working right. <laughs> you owe her her security deposit, which was how much? It was 500 Did either of you seek any medical treatment for your injuries? No, yes, no. I did. I'm not talking about you. <laughs> now, where did you move when you moved? I was actually homeless for eight days. I was allowed to stay at um, my, my boyfriend as roommate with another roommate, and that's he was fine. out of town. That's fine. Don't make up things as we go along. You weren't homeless because you were able to sleep someplace. Well, yes. I mean, I was without a permanent... Or Fine. And then you found someplace. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. whole thing is very, very unfortunate. Really, very unfortunate. you want to say anything to me? No. <laughs> you want your security deposit back? Absolutely. You got it. Judgment for the plaintiff. They amount to $500. Your counterclaims dismissed. That's all. Why does that excuse me step out? 19-year-old Chris Alford is suing his ex-girlfriend, 19-year-old Ashley Griffin, for a loan to pay her rent. Ashley says Chris gave her the money. Mr. Alford, the defendant used to be your girlfriend. According to your complaint, you are no longer involved in the relationship, but at some point prior to your breaking up, you loaned her $300. You want that money back? Yes. Uh, this is after we broke up. Like We broke up, then she called me. So you lent her the money after you were no longer together? Yes. When did you lend her the money, sir? I sent it the 1st of July. Tell me about that. All right, um, we broke up with her when she came up. She came up where? To yes. Philly. We was no longer seeing each other. You live in Philadelphia? Yes. You live where? Florida. And when did she come to Philadelphia? Like the, be the beginning of June. Who did she stay with? Her mom, I guess. Your mom lives in Philadelphia? Outside of Philadelphia. Stop moving up and down. When she came up to Philadelphia to visit her mother and you, I assume. I saw, I saw her a couple hours. That's not Were true, Were you still Yana. dating? Then, yeah. What caused you to stop seeing each other in a romantic way? Chris Alford says ex-girlfriend Ashley Griffin owes for a loan to pay her rent. Chris also says Ashley is a two-timer. Okay, go ahead. All right, she, she missed her flight, right? In the morning time, she missed her flight. She missed her flight going back to Florida? Yes. When was that? I, I don't know the exact date. It was sometime in July. Mm. He said you went up in June. No, it was like some the middle of July sometime. Did you miss your flight going home? Yes, ma'am. When you were in Philadelphia? Yes, ma'am. All right. What happened when she missed her flight, sir? Uh, she missed her flight, and she called some guy and was like, I missed my flight. Uh, it cost $50 or something to pay the balance or something. I, I was like, Who, who's that on the phone? And I turned around, whatever, because I was half asleep when all this happened. She hit me, whatever, like, oh, missed my flight. Da -da -da -da. So what you're saying is she was sleeping over at your house? Mm hmm Yes. Well, then she, you were with her more than just a couple of hours during this visit to Philadelphia. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so you decided you didn't want to see her anymore because she was talking to somebody else and borrowed $50 from somebody else. Is that what you're trying to tell me, Mr. Alfred? Could we get to it, please? <laughs> I'm, all right. Well, is that what happened? Other stuff, too, but that's what started it all. And then this other young man sent you money or called up and said, add the ticket on his credit card, and you went home. Yes, ma'am. 
Tell me why you needed this $300, Miss Griffin. Can I start from the beginning? No. Well, because I was going back home in July, so I had already bought my ticket and I was short for my rent. So I asked him for the money. I didn't say, can I borrow it? I asked him, can I have it? And he said, yeah. And he gave me the money. So you needed the $300 for rent because you had spent the money. But I was off. And we spent more than just that night together. He picked me up from the airport, and I was with him that day. And we went to go pick up his Tell witness. Tell me about when you called him and asked him for the money. Well, I called him, and I pretty much said I needed the money for the rent because I was short. Where were you when he gave you the money? I was at my house. He In Western, Florida? Yes, ma'am. He Western Union me the money. You have the receipt for Western Union? Yes, I do. Can I see it, please? Mr. Alford, I'd like you to tell me about the conversation that you had with her about the $300, please. All right, I'm in the car, me and three friends of mine, and my phone rings. And I put it on speaker because I couldn't drive and talk. So I'm, I'm talking to her, and she's like, oh, my God, I don't have enough money to pay for my rent, this, this, and that. And I'm like, she at, at first, I'm like, oh, like, what am I supposed to do about that? Then she said, would it be possible if you could send me $300, and I will pay you back next Friday on my paycheck? Everybody in the car heard, heard her say that. Don't say what they heard. Did you hear it? I heard it. Clearly, it's right here. The phone's right here. I was listening, talking, like, all right, well, I can't spare it. I mean, so you got to send it back next Friday. And you can see on, the, on Western Union, date was July 1st. If she just now said she was in Philly. You're absolutely right, sir. It was July 1st. I said he sent me the money July 1st. I said I went home after July 1st. Are you telling me you went home and then continued your relationship with him after he sent you the money? Yes, we were still together, so I don't know why he's saying we weren't. We were together at that time. Why would I stay at his house? Why would he pick me up from the airport if we weren't it together? A, it he in, says it was in June. It was in June. That's why he was at my house. It was in June, man. Well, you must have your airline ticket. I don't have it. Who was this other person that you called for $50? All right, when he came down, he knew about the guy already. Don't tell me what he knew. I didn't ask you for a whole story. I said, who was this other person? It was some other guy that I was messing with. Oh. So, shh. So, now, what you want me to believe is he sent you $300 to help you cover your rent. Then you went up to Philadelphia to see him. But at the time that he sent you the $300 for the rent, you were messing around with somebody else that he didn't know about. Is that no, right? No, he knew about him. We were only, like, friends. No, we weren't friends. We were more than friends. But at that time, I knew I could depend on him. <laughs> <sighs> you have to learn that you have to stand on your own two feet. You have to stop relying on people, and you have to stop using people. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. Good. Judgment for the plaintiff for the amount of $300. That's all. Thank you. I desire excuse. You may step out. Wayne Otis claims website owner Jamila Donaldson posted his picture on her website. Mr. Otis, it is your claim that the defendant who runs a website embarrassed you on her website and you want to be compensated. Yes. And Ms. Donaldson said that, well, she didn't really embarrass you on the website. She's going to explain to me what the website is all about, but she said whether or not you were embarrassed, she is protected by the Constitution of the United States. That's your defense. Yes, ma'am. Tell me about this website. But you want to know what happened that day or how did I get to the website? Well, why don't, if you don't really understand it, I'll let Ms. Donaldson explain the website to me. Okay. Uh, the website is called hotghettomess.com. Hot? Hot ghetto mess com. And what is its function? Well, I started about a year and a half ago, and the function was I was sort of looking at the images that were coming out of largely the African-American community, and I felt like we were bombarded with these negative images, um, you know, this glamorization of thug life and thug living, the degradation of women, um, and just this obsession with all that is low and ghetto. So I thought that I would do the website as sort of a social commentary to say that this is not what we're supposed to be doing. We should not be promulgating these images. Sounds so, like a laudable goal. Yes, thank you. And so um, the website basically consists of people sending in pictures. And what I do is try to take a lot of images and put them in a context. Um, I think we, in the media, and especially the young people with the videos and the movies, we, are, we see these images all the time, but no one puts them in the context and says, this is not good. This Show, is not give positive. me an example. Uh, I don't have anyone. Oh, well, yes, OK, here's one. All right, let me see. But I'll also say that in addition to showing hot ghetto mess, I counter that with not ghetto and images that we should strive to be more like. And I could, I'm sorry, Mr. Bird. 
here's some of the not ghetto. I sort of counter and try to give a balance. And I also have lyrics on there, lyrics that are being put out, and I contrast okay. positive and negative lyrics. I do movies. I got it. Just a second. Sorry, I also have a mission statement. Just, just a second. Okay. Just a second. I don't want to read your mission statement. Okay, it's just posted on the website, I so see. people just know just what I'm doing. Okay. It's really a positive message that you're trying to present by showing good examples of behavior, bad examples of behavior, good examples of images, bad examples of images. You don't select the pictures with the exception of the fact that people send in pictures to you and you put them on the website and say, you're free to comment. Right. And somebody sent you in his picture. Yes, ma'am. Where did they get the picture from? It was um, this online site we have in school. I'm a college student, and it's called Facebook. What it is, it's like a directory of students that go to various colleges. So you sat for a photograph or submitted a photograph to this book, and from that book, somebody took out the picture and sent it to the defendant. Yes. So let me see your page that you're complaining about. This right here is the, um, the profile of myself, and these right here are like the categories, like the people that were sitting around mine, so I don't see anything positive around well, those. Let me, let me just see what yours is. Okay. And it's a little log up there where they get to comment about the pictures. So she posted this photograph. Yes. Right? Well, what are you complaining about? Because she posted my photograph with her company logo on it as if it was her picture. I don't belong on that picture with those people. I mean, look at the category that I'm in. What category are you in? I'm in the category called Playboys. Mr. Rodas. Yes, ma'am. Isn't a bad picture? It's a very nice likeness. Very sexy, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Thank you. Look like a Playboy. What's wrong with that? I don't like the fact that she also gives them comments. I mean, it's negative comments. No one said anything good. Well, that's not her fault. Nobody said anything good. But I wouldn't have said anything bad about this picture. If I would have looked at it, I would have said, too, the handsome guy. Got a sort of a come-hither look. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rodas, I want you to lighten up a little bit, Mr. Rodas. I don't think, by the way, Ms. Donaldson, that your First Amendment argument is 100% valid because Mr. Rodas is not a public figure. But you don't say anything derogatory about him. Now, let me say that if she posted this picture of you and wrote, bank robber, pedophile, something that wasn't true and just nasty, I would mop up the floor with her and give you whatever you wanted because you are not a public figure and she can't print anything that's not true about you. But once you allow your photograph to be out there as part of a student profile, the internet is something that sort of gobbles up all the information that it can get. It's a sponge. I don't know much about the internet because I don't use that machine myself, but I know that you can find out, any, you can find out what kind of microbes live 20,000 leagues under the sea if anybody wants that information. All you have to do is log in the right whatever. So if once you put your picture out there in public space, and it is in public space if you put it out in a book, it might end up here. So you have to be careful. If this isn't a picture that you particularly liked, you shouldn't have put it in your college profile. Who selected the picture? I did. I right. Loved that picture. Well, I loved that if picture. you didn't like the picture and if you thought it presented you in a bad light, then I wouldn't have selected this picture. But I love that picture. Good. <laughs> I'm just saying, I don't think there's anything wrong with this picture. And all she's doing, Miss Donaldson is doing, is saying, What do you think of this picture? Is this the way African American males want to present themselves? I don't see anything wrong with this picture. Now, somebody may say, I'd rather see him in a cap and gown, you know? I would rather see Colin Powell. I mean, he's got a picture of Colin. But that, that's somebody's opinion. That's not her opinion, necessarily. That's somebody else's opinion. I happen to agree with you. It's a nice picture. A lot of people saw it. Mm -hmm. Your friends, did they say to you, they, gee, that's a horrible picture that really depicts you in a terrible light? No one said that. No. I mean, you're not doing anything untoward in this picture. So my question is, my basic thing was I sent her an email asking her to remove it. And it's, I mean, when I found it, it was October 26th. 
And even as of this morning, when I was at the hotel, it's still there. Now, she doesn't have to remove it. Would it be nice if she removed it if it bothers you? Yes, it would. Yeah. Now, we've gotten rid of the legal aspect of this case. Now we're getting to what I consider the moral aspect of the case, and since I have other things to do today, I'm going to address that relatively briefly. If Mr. Otis is troubled by this picture, and I guarantee you there are lots of other pictures that are just waiting to be published on your website, why don't you just take it off? Because I felt like that would be a dangerous precedent. Then everyone would email me and just tell me to take their pictures down. Well, they might. Then HotGhettoMess.com wouldn't exist. There are people out there who think that dressing inappropriately, mm -hmm. calling attention to themselves, you know, I mean, negative attention to themselves is the way to go. They're not going to be angry. You, I guarantee you, you will get all of the negative examples that you want on your website because there is no want in this country for stupid people. Yes. They're all around us. Touch every third person, you're going to find an idiot. <laughs> So you don't have to worry that you're not going to have plenty of product. Mr. Otis doesn't want to be used as an example. So when are you going to remove it? I'll remove it as soon as I get back to my computer. And I know that with you, that's going to be some time today. Yes. Good. <laughs> satisfied? Not really. Well, that's too bad. You better get satisfied. That's all. Case is dismissed. <laughs> Parties are excused. You may step out. Melissa Ponsolet Del Sol says director Dr. Noel Howell owes for her services as a makeup artist on his film. Dr. Howell is countersuing for money owed. Is it Ms. Del Sol? Yes. You were hired by the defendant, according to your complaint, to be makeup artist in a photo shoot that he was organizing on the island of Antigua? Almost. I, it was a feature film, actually. And you traveled to Antigua? Correct. And it is your claim that he owes you money. He says that he paid you some money, actually, but you left the project and you were a nut while you were there and you caused him to spend thousands of dollars in down production time and your replacement and he has a counterclaim. How much was he supposed to pay you? $2,000 for my services. So far, is that correct, Mr. Howell? Yes, it is. And what kind of film were you making? It's an action flick. How much money did you have to make this film? Uh, about 150,000 US. Have you ever made a film before? Yes. How many films? Two prior to this. Where? In what country? Uh, I made one in Antigua and I made one in New York. Was the one that you made in New York a full-length feature? Yes, it was. Did it sell anything? It's in, in production, post-production. Was the film that was made in Antigua completed? It was completed. Okay. How much were you paid by him of the $2,000 that was agreed upon? 600. When did you arrive? I arrived January 16th. When did you leave? February 1st. When were you supposed to leave? February 10th. So you didn't complete the job? No. Tell me why. Because he basically sexually harassed me. The cast was sexually harassing me. They failed to provide me with food and water as agreed upon three times a day. Various well, violent you, things happened. What did you eat? Um, I was lucky to eat one times a day, and usually it was a couple pieces of lettuce and an egg. Sometimes I got something called goat water, which is what they do when they take a goat and they, they kill it and they put it in some rainwater on the front lawn and they, they boil it, and it, it's not quite soup. Where did it say in your contract that he was supposed to provide you with meals? Um, I, I actually never received a written contract. That was another reason why we are having this trouble. We have a verbal contract. Um, the contract included that he would pay me for my services rendered, for my makeup kit expenses, for um, my lodging, food, and transportation, and he was also supposed to supply me with a cell phone, which he never did. And in exchange for all of that, you were supposed to work from January 16th to February 10th to February 10th? I was unable to. Why? Through the circumstances that they were putting me through. He, I, how, many I other, reasoned, how many other people left? I actually heard a few rumors that a few other I'm people... I'm not interested in rumors. Okay. How many people that you know the that wardrobe you will be able to name for yes. me left the production? I do know for a fact that the wardrobe lady left. Did the wardrobe lady leave? No. Did she finish the production? She, she did finish the production. Did she leave before or after you did? Before. So you actually knew she left? Right. I didn't see her. Well, why didn't you tell me that first? It's slipped my mind. I'm sorry. What happened, Mr. Howell? Why did she leave? Well, she, Melissa had to leave for a number of reasons. The main reason was because 
Melissa was incapable of doing her work. She was smoking and drinking. Her action became so bizarre, it was hilarious at times, dangerous at times. And I had to um, replace her on, on, on more than one occasion with makeup artists because she just could not function. When you say she was drinking, you mean she was intoxicated? Well, she was drinking and her behavior would lead me to be if she was intoxicated, but I... Give me an example. Um, on Saturday the 24th of January, I got on set and I was like, Yo, you need to go talk to Melissa. I'm like, what's going on? And they say, I don't know what's so. So I went over to her, and she was like, Why? Why? And I got it. I got yes, it. Yes, Your Honor. And it was behavior like that. I was like, Melissa, what's going on? And then she was like, Oh, Doc. Um, then she started complaining about a lot of things that was happening, and then. What was she complaining about, Mr. Okay, one of the things she was complaining about is that there was a. A person who was on the set, he wasn't part of the production team, and Melissa and, and him had become acquaintance, and she was stating that he was actually trying to have sex with her. Who was this person, if uh, he wasn't part of the production team? What happened was we needed some guns, and he had brought, the, he, flew to, he flew in from New York to bring down some guns for us. His name he, was Robert. He flew down to bring guns? Yes. What kind of guns? Um, prop guns. Prop guns? Yes. So he actually flew down at your request to... to add things to your production. To, to the production, right. All right, so he was there at your request, and she was complaining that he was making sexual advances towards her? Yeah, that was a Saturday night, yes. That was on the 24th? 24th, Saturday the 24th. So what did you do? What did you say to her? I told Melissa that I would address the issue after we finished the set. But let's go, let's you get you calmed down, and I will talk to him after I got taken care of her and her anxiety. So what did you do? So I told her I'm going to do three things to make sure that she feels more comfortable on the set. Issue number one. One, there'll be no male around, around her talking to her unless they were sitting in her makeup chair because she was complaining that there were other people frequenting her set. Number two, I told her there'll be no more smoking on set. You mean smoking cigarettes or smoking? Smoking weed. Smoking weed? Oh. And Yana, if I must add, she was smoking the good weed. It was a strong Antigua <laughs> weed. And she was? Yes. Was smoking the good Antigua ganja. She, 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 she was smoking marijuana. Marijuana. Is that right? No, it's not. Yeah, sure it's it is. Complete lie. He's, uh, he's just saying. He's absolutely telling me the truth. No, he's not. Yeah, he is. No, Go ahead. He's not. The third thing was I was going to adjust, try and adjust the source of her weed. The source. Yes. So you were saying that if Robert's sexually harassing you, I want you to stop smoking weed, and I'm going to get rid of your supplier. Yes. Sounds like an interesting. Production, Mr. Howard. No, Your Honor, there was more than just the sexual harassment. There was a lot going on, and I was trying to address the issues. The sexual harassment was just one part of the issue. Okay. Did you have complained to him about sexual harassment by anybody other than Robert? Yes, I did. Who? There were a few people who were grips. And what were they doing? They set up light stands, they handled the lighting. No, I don't mean what were they doing as grips. Oh, I mean, I'm what sorry. were they doing to you? <laughs> By them and they would touch me and they would tell me about how later that night they would like to do various things to me. And what did you say to them? I said that that was very inappropriate and I would like them to not talk to me in that way anymore. Your Honor, that's untrue. The only one she complained to you about was Robert? Was Robert. I believe him. I believe him. Now, I just want to know why you left on February 1st. Because he no longer was letting, giving me the means to do my job. He kept confiscating my makeup kit every night, so I wasn't able to clean and organize my brushes and my makeup kit. So I would arrive to set with dirty brushes. I finally said to him, this is unacceptable. As we've spoken about this many times, I need to be able to have my makeup kit in my possession at night so that I can organize it, clean my brushes, and arrive on set and do my job. Was there when ever I a time... Sorry. Was there ever a time that you did not show up on the set on time, ready to proceed? No. Yes, Your Honor, there were times. First of all, I've never, ever touched her makeup kit. Never confiscated anything to do with her makeup kit. And why would I want a dirty makeup on my set? I would never do such a thing, Your Honor. <laughs> I don't understand why he took your makeup kit. I, I frankly don't understand either. However, I do know that when I was finally returned to me, $4,000 worth of makeup was removed from it. And I'm not sure if it's because he wanted to keep it to give to his new makeup artists to use on his film. Who bought the makeup? That was my makeup. You purchased the makeup and he stole your makeup? Yes. Yeah, I have receipts here that I gave her my credit card over the phone. She used a credit card. She bought makeup with a credit card. Then she called me and she told me I owed her $700 for the makeup. I went and I gave her cash. However, later I found out that that 700 include 
500 something dollars that was actually purchased on my credit card. So not only did I give her the $780 cash for everything, she also used a credit card. So she, she only spent maybe 200 something dollars of her own money. So Melissa is a con artist. She's very good at this thing. And I guess from the onset, that's what she was doing. I actually have the receipt for that 76530. And it was actually my father's Visa card, not his. And Your Honor, I have the receipt that she submitted to me, and this is what she, the receipt she gave me. Just a minute. And on this, this is what she told me she spent, and if my memory serves me correctly, it said MasterCard. And she gave me this. This receipt that you gave me is for $532.60. Right. What she has here is $765 purchased on the 13th of January. Yeah, Your Honor, I have, I have the rest of the receipt. This is what she gave me. She gave me everything here together, $776. And that what she gave me was supposed to be, this was supposed to be cash. And that part of it was supposed to be the credit card. Did you take back any makeup from her? I did not. Did you take any makeup from her kit? I did not. Did anybody as part of your production team? Someone might, someone might have, but on, on, not to my knowledge. The only thing that I know there was a bottle of blood that was left in the office that we end up using. What I'm asking you is, did you or anyone at your direction take makeup from her kit? No. Okay. I have a list of the missing makeup inventory. Just a second. Did you see him take any makeup from your kit? I did see him remove several items of my makeup from my hotel room when he burst into the door and threatened to hit me in the face. Yeah, no, just, just a second. Ms. Delso, what items do you tell me now that you saw him take out of your makeup kit four gallons of blood other than that i didn't see it with my own eyes you're on a four Shit. gallons of blood cannot hold in the makeup hey, kit. hey just a second Shh. i'm sorry you didn't see him take no, anything all i else? know is that when i walked off set because i had dehydration and sunstroke because no one would let me sit in their car of the shelter or give me any water on set there we go again sure, sure, sure. I, be quiet <laughs> my makeup be kit quiet. was left on set and it was unlocked I have no idea who took it. Okay, let me hear your counterclaim, sir. 30 seconds or less. Uh, Your Honor, because of her behavior, her inability to perform the job that she was expected to do, I had to bring in an assistant, I had to bring in another makeup artist. I also end up paying a hospital bill because of her behavior. She was seen by a doctor there. What were you seen by a doctor He for? actually forced me to see a doctor while I was there. Just and it was to die for, for shh. shh. Well, at the time, I had no idea. After he, when I was seen by the doctor, I was told that I was not homicidal or suicidal, which was rather shocking. So you went to see a doctor in Antigua? In a yes, hospital? but it wasn't that I went to go see them. We were actually shooting a scene in a clinic that day. So he escorted me into the clinic, and I thought I was going in there to set up my makeup kit. And then suddenly, I was alone in a room with the doctor. Don't go on any more photo shoots to Antigua. I won't. <laughs> Very good. Mr. Howell, when you have a large production staff, sir, I assume you've had difficulties before of various kinds, not necessarily with makeup artists, but with people who aren't performing their job. Would that be a fair statement? Yes. And you had to replace them? Yes. Have you ever sued anybody for that, sir? Not as yet. You will be unsuccessful if you sue them. You want to know why? Why? Because the courts are busy enough. You got to choose your people better get better recommendations do whatever you have to do as the ceo of this organization to make sure that you hire people who can do the job but you don't go around suing them afterwards if your production is slow yeah, down. Afterward. listen to me we're too busy to clean up after ceos who don't do their homework and hire appropriate people and if there's something wrong with her because she has a mental disability which i assume that you thought she had if you took her to a doctor then you didn't do your homework carefully enough. But you don't get paid for that, sir. Your counterclaim is dismissed. Similarly, madam, you did not fulfill your contract. You went home. He stole your makeup. I'm not sure what happened there. He got paid a little. It wasn't a pleasant experience. Yeah, it was the week. Hey, I... <laughs> Listen to me and don't interrupt me. Did I give you plenty of opportunity to talk? Yes, ma'am. I assume that the plaintiff was not the only one on your set who was smoking this wonderful weed that they had in Antigua. 
I assume that that would be correct, sir. Look over there at his face. Is he there? Yeah, he yeah. was there. You get my drift? Yeah, I don't smoke. Good. Me neither. But I'm sure there were people there who did. Right? Yeah, Melissa. Only her? You think that I believe that? No, a few, a few. A few, a few. few. People, but not, and that don't have anything to do with the set. Right, very good. Okay. Goodbye, folks. I don't think you have a case, madam. You got paid some money. I know he doesn't. That's all. 24-year-old Nicole Johnson is suing her neighbor, 23-year-old Sally Jones, for the cost to fix her car. Nicole claims Sally's son, 5-year-old Darian, scratched her paint job with rocks. Miss Johnson, your complaint is that Miss Jones's son, that would be this little tyke over here, vandalized your car with some sort of an implement. You want her to pay for the damage. Miss Jones says, well, she's not sure if her son did it. And if he did it, he had an accomplice of similar age. And why aren't you suing the accomplice, too? That's your defense. Yes, ma'am. Well, Miss Jones, let me ask you this question. If you believe that your son was responsible for part of the damage, you would acknowledge that and would be prepared to pay for part of the damage. Would that be a fair statement? Yes, ma'am. What proof do you have that Miss Jones's son, because you didn't see it, no. vandalized your car? I have a witness who says she saw him do it. OK. When did this happen? Uh, July 11th at approximately 7.30, 8 a.m. And the witness that you had would be this little girl. Mm -hmm. And she's five? Yes. Whose child is she? Uh, one of our other neighbors. Her name's Angela Twyman. And what's her name? Michaela. Michaela, would you like to come up and talk to me? Okay. You all right? Okay. Hi, Michaela. You know who I am? <laughs> you don't know? Do you know why you're here? And you don't know why you're here. Who did you come with today? Oh, I see this is going to be interesting. <laughs> Do you know this little boy? Is he a friend of yours? Do you know Miss Jones? Is she a neighbor of yours? Can you talk? Can you tell me your full name? Let me hear. Michaela. And what's your last name, Michaela? Michaela and Twyman. Do you want to talk to me about what happened with Miss Johnson's car? You want to tell me what happened? OK, tell me what happened. He spit on the car. He spit on the car? Did you see him do that? Did you see him do anything else to the car, Michaela? What else did you see him do? He scratched it. What did he scratch it with? A rock. Did you see him with the rock in his hand? Did you have a rock in your hand? Was anybody else with him when he had the rock in his hand? No. But you're sure you saw him scratch the car with a rock? After you saw him scratch the car, Michaela, did you go and tell anybody? Who did you tell? His parents. His parents? Oh. Did you tell them right away? OK. You can go and sit down now. Thank you. Michaela came and told you that about that? No, ma'am. She never came and told you that? No, ma'am. Did she tell you? Um, I called. I assume that from the, the way the marks are, they're huge, just circles, scribbles, they're all at very low positions. I assumed it was a child. And I assumed that if I asked enough children, one of them would tell on the other. So I called her parents and I said, you know, later on today when the kids are home, please ask them if they saw anyone playing around with Snicky's car. And in the background, I could hear her say, I did, I saw Darian. And her mom said, will you do me a favor? Will you go outside and on mommy's car, will you touch the spots that you saw him touching on Miss Nikki's car? And she said, okay, she's touching the hood, the driver's side door, and the passenger door on the same side as the driver's side. And she said, is that, you know, is that right? And I said, yeah, that's exactly where the damage is. Tell me your name. Darian. Darian, I want you to come up here and sit up here and talk to me. <laughs> Rubble, a handful. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I, I do know that. <laughs> a handful. Okay. Tell me, Jim. Okay. Um, me and Michaela did it. You and Michaela both did it? Well, tell me how that happened, Darian. Me and Michaela had rocks. Well, how many rocks did you have in your hand? One. And where did you get the rock from? Off the ground. And what about Michaela? Did she have a rock, too? Yeah. So why did you decide to scratch Miss Johnson's car? I don't know. Well, does your mom have a car? Yeah, great. Hmm? Great. She has a great car. 
Darian, if you saw children scratching your mother's car, would you be angry with them? Because that's not the right thing to do, right? And your mommy would be very upset that somebody scratched her car, wouldn't she? She would be sad. Are you ever going to do that again? Because you know you can get into trouble for doing that to other people's property, right? How many marks did you make on the car? And how many marks did Michaela make on the car? So you made more marks than Michaela. Did Michaela make bigger marks than you or littler marks than you? She made smaller marks than you. Show me with your hands how big were the marks that you made on the car. Big ones. And she made little ones. Is that right? She made little ones. And show me your size. The ones you made were bigger ones. Now, when your mom asked you about Miss Johnson's car, did you tell her the truth right away? My dad. You told your dad the truth right away? And what did you tell him? I scratched it. And when did you tell your mom and your dad that Michaela was there, too? I didn't tell them. I only told my dad. When did you tell your dad that Michaela was there, too? Did you tell him right away, or did you tell him later? Right away. Okay. Go and step down. I have a feeling he did a little more damage than Michaela did, but my sense is that Michaela was there. Made a few little marks. Miss Johnson, I know that you don't like to believe it, but cute little Michaela <laughs> scratched your car. She didn't do as much damage as this little guy did. And in his own five-year-old way, he really told me the truth about that because I don't know how many scratches were on the car, but clearly he said he did more than she did. Mm -hmm. And when I asked him, you saw, mm -hmm. how big were her scratches? He said, well, they were really teeny. Mine were bigger. But well, one gets the sense that at least he's telling the truth, that there was some co-participation. And she said that she helped him wipe them off with a spit so that he wouldn't get into trouble. That's oh. what she told her mom. Oh, OK. She said, I, I helped, he spit all over the car, and I helped him rub them off, but they weren't coming off. OK. So you get it, mm -hmm. that Michaela's folks have to be responsible for some of the damage to the car. I also have rental car receipts because they said it's going to take four to five days. So I have um, $182.04 because they won't do it on the weekend, not all of it, and I work about 45 minutes from home. Okay. So I have a rental car receipt for $182.04. $422. That's half. Judgment for the plaintiff in the amount of $422. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Excuse. Smart, but a handful, Miss Jones. Thank you. <laughs> 18-year-old Matthew Johnston is suing his ex-friend's father, Stan Valentine, for damage to his car. Matthew says Stan's son, 18-year-old Josh, dented the hood when he jumped on it. It is your complaint that you were at a party where there was drinking going on, and at that party, this young man jumped on the hood of your car, caused about $750 worth of damage on the car, and you want him to pay for it. That's correct. Now, young Josh says that everybody was drunk. He's not exactly sure what happened. But his father has an interesting defense. So you're going to tell me at this party. It was uh, on or about July 14th. Was it July 14th? Uh, I believe so, it was. And at whose house was the party? Uh, at this girl named Emma's. Uh, her graduating class was the year before me. And I knew friends that knew her. Emma has a last name? Uh, I'm not sure what her last name is, ma'am. How many people were at the party? Maybe about 20, a little, little less. Were you an invited guest? I think it was kind of like just a get together of the people who had known those people. So I went with friends. So no, I was not. It was easier, right? Yeah. No, you weren't invited no, guest. No, I wasn't invited. <laughs> What's the drinking age where you are? Uh, 21, ma'am. How old is Emma? Uh, 19. Were her parents home? Uh, no, they were not. They gone for the weekend? Uh, yes, I believe so, they were. <laughs> Listen out there in television land. <laughs> Lock the doors. If you go away for a weekend and you have teenagers, your house will never be safe. That's true. Right, Matthew? Yes. Matthew Johnston says former friend Josh Valentine jumped on the hood of his car when he was drunk. Okay. Now, tell me when it was that Josh jumped on the hood of your car. It was about uh, 1130 that night. Christopher noticed that a friend of ours, David, he was already past curfew, and he was very intoxicated, and we needed to get him home. 
So Chris suggests that we take him home. So about 15 minutes later, we're outside in the parking lot putting David in. We're all about ready to go. Putting David in the car? Yes, David in the car. And then Chris is in the front Who seat. Who was driving? I was driving. Your car? Yes. And so I get in the driver's seat. Everyone gets inside the car. And next thing I know, Josh comes out from the left side and jumps on my car. His knee hits the side of the fender on the left side of the car. At that point, I was just furious. I just turned on the car and just left. Went and took David home, went and brought Chris back, stayed at the party for maybe like another hour. Ended up that Andre needed a ride home. His car was parked at Josh's house. That's Josh as well needed a ride home. Josh was pretty drunk. I didn't really want to take Josh home because he just jumped on my car. Andre said he needed to take him home. Is that right? No, ma'am. Step up. You're Andre? Yes, ma'am. You needed a ride home because you had been drinking? Yes, ma'am. And he had been drinking? Yes, ma'am. Did you see him jump on the hood of his car? Yes, ma'am. Tell me what happened. Um, Josh actually comes on and puts his hands on the car. It doesn't, I mean, it could have been forceful, but it wasn't enough to see that would knock a dent in the car. But yes, he did slam on the front of the car, told him to stop, and um, we didn't want him to take Dave home. Well, you did a lot of double talking there at the very end, but what I gather that you said was, yes, you saw Josh, who had been drinking, put his hands in a forceful manner on Matthew's car. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Do you have a car? Yes, ma'am. What kind of car do you have? I know two black Mustang. Where did you leave the car? At Joshua's house, ma'am. Why? Because I wasn't going to drive that night. Because you were drinking? Yes, ma'am. Smart. So you're smart enough to know that you don't want to get into a car somebody driving who has been drinking? Yes, ma'am. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Now, to drive you home? Yes, ma'am. Is that right? Yes. One must assume from the fact that you allowed Matthew to drive you home that you felt as if Matthew was in good enough shape to drive you home. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Okay, Mr. Valentine, now I'll yes. hear you, sir. I feel that uh, based on the circumstances, uh, Matthew was in fact drinking quite heavily. Uh, you don't know that. That's not according to your witness. Um, not according to your witness. Your witness just testified, sir, unequivocally, that he felt sufficiently comfortable with Matthew driving him home, and he would not have gotten into a car with somebody who had been intoxicated, <laughs> so that he left his car home because he wasn't going to drink and drive, but he allowed Matthew to drive him home because Matthew was sober enough to drive home. So let's get over that. Okay, now you're going to tell me why he's not responsible. Well, uh, maybe he is to a certain extent. Um... I would uh, say that he has some partial responsibility, possibly, if anything. There are some inconsistencies in Matt's story. First of all, he didn't contact Josh the next day. It was... I didn't ask about contacting him okay. the next day. Oh, well, I guess I feel that Matt has responsibility. I feel the people that put Just on the second. party had some Just responsibility. Why does Matt have responsibility? Because he was drinking. What does that have to do with the dent on the car? Well, uh, I think if you're going to go out and go drinking and driving and partying and you're underage, you probably should not be surprised if there are going to be negative consequences. I think he should have some responsibility. <laughs> That's what we're talking about here, Mr. Valentine, responsibility. Mm -hmm. yes. Where's yours? Uh, we have maybe some partial responsibility. Which part? Let me hear which part you think you have responsibility for. Maybe a third of it. That's, that was what I felt was fair and reasonable. Well. There is a part of me, sir, that says that I think that you have the right, if you wish, to sue the people whose home this party was held at for inadequate supervision. Okay. If that's what you think you want to do. But he, you, caused damage to his car. Can I see an estimate for the car, please? Yes. Six forty nine oh seven to pull out the dent. Is that right? That is correct. That's what you owe him. That seems you go to a school? bit steep. You go to school? I do not. I work. Really? Terrific. What kind of job do you have? I work at BAE Container Solutions, making. How old are you? I'm eighteen right now. You work full time? No. What do you do at the other part of the time? Not work. What do you do? <laughs> Stay at my house. I don't know. Is that productive? No, it's not. I can't have a full-time job yet. How about going to school? I choose not to. Well, do you mow the lawn, clean the house, build a garage? What do you do? I actually, I live in my own apartment with Andre and my other friend, Justin. Who pays the bills? Me, Andre, and Justin. With a part-time job? Yeah, it's really cheap out there. <laughs> Great. Okay, judgment for the plaintiff for the amount of $649.07. Parties are excused. You may step out. Nicole Hendershot.
claims ex-boyfriend Kevin Gleason racked up over $6,000 on her credit card. Okay. All right, Miss Hendershot, this used to be your boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And your complaint is that you made two loans to him. Mm -hmm. One was by giving him your credit card and allowing him to make some purchases on it. And then, since he wasn't paying you back, that you would get your money back as if he had a new job. And a new job needed new clothes. So he asked if you would loan him the money for some new clothes. You bought him $3,000 worth of clothes. And he paid you back nada. That's not the outfit she bought you, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's not GQ. <laughs> kind of early gangster. <laughs> Mr. Gleason says that you were very, very nice to him and all of the things that he purchased were gifts. How old are you, Miss Hendershot? 23. Do you work? Yep, full time. What kind of job do you have? Inventory manager at a car dealership. You've been there for how long? A year and a couple months. How much do you earn annually? Probably about $32,000. Nice. You live by yourself? I live with a uh, family. You pay rent? No. What okay. do you mean you live with a family? What I live with my grandparents. Oh, so you don't pay rent? I don't pay rent. Eventually, you're going to have to do that. Yes, <laughs> you know. It's expensive. They in made New York. a movie about that. They <laughs> get a launch. You got a launch one day. And what about you, Mr. Gleason? What do you do for a living, sir? Right now, I just signed up for the National Guard, Army. National. How old are you? Twenty-one. Signed up for the National Guard. Yes, ma'am. Before you signed up for the National Guard, what were you doing to support yourself? Nothing, really. Who do you live with? I live with my grandmother. What does she do for a living? Uh, she used to housekeep. And what does she do now? She gets a pension, I do believe, from um, a past job that she had. So she gets a small pension and she was doing housework? Yes, ma'am. And you were just laying home and eating food and doing what, Mr. Gleason? Um, hanging out with friends. While your grandmother was collecting a pension and cleaning other people's homes. Is that what you're telling me? I just want to get a picture of you, sir. Uh, yes. Okay, Miss Hendershot, tell me about the first loan. When I first met him, he told me that... When did you first meet him? Mid-September. Where? Through a friend. You mean somebody introduced you to him as a blind date? Yeah. Take that friend and cross them off the list. <laughs> <laughs> that person is not a friend to you. That person is his friend. <laughs> so we met mid-September, started dating. He told me his... Ex when you went out with him, where would you go? Movies. Who paid? Me or him. Where'd you get money from? I get a check in the mail from my parents. For what? They're both deceased, so I get a social security check from them, each of them. Until you're how old? I think it's home 25, I do believe. How much do you get? Around like 675. It, it like fluctuates. A month? Yes. Even if you're over 21 years old? Yes, ma'am. And laying around your grandmother's house? Yes. This is some America. <laughs> okay, so sometimes you paid, sometimes he paid. You started mm -hmm. dating and keep going. Told me he had just quit his job. What job did you have? I worked at a Volkswagen dealer. Doing what? Off the books, mechanic work, like filling up tires, making sure the cars were expected and all that. And how much did they pay you off the books for that? About like $20 a day. $20 a day? Clearly on his way up the corporate ladder. <laughs> <laughs> quit his job putting air in tires for $20 a day, and go ahead. He said he was in the military, so he was getting a, a check from that, but it was going into a bank account that he couldn't He touch. was in the military. That's what he told me. Go ahead. So he asked me if I, he can use my credit card for his cell phone bill. I said, OK. Well, what was wrong with his credit card? Well, he had bad credit, because his ex-girlfriend had run up his credit cards while he was in Iraq, and now he has When bad were you in Iraq, sir? <laughs> Got me. What? Got me. Okay, so you gave him your credit card to pay your cell phone bill. And what was he supposed to do? Pay you back? Yeah, he was supposed to pay me back. I also authorized him to buy a TV for his car. A TV for his car? Granted that he would pay me right away. Don't you feel like an idiot? <laughs> but I guarantee you this, Mr. Gleason, if you don't feel like an idiot now, by the time you leave here, <laughs> I'm hoping for better results. <laughs> yes, ma'am. He's not George Clooney, you know. I've learned my lesson. Why did you need a TV for your car? I said I wanted one, and she offered to get it. Well, who got it, you or she? She got it, and she said, you have to pay it back. And then, around Christmas time, she's like, oh, it's just a present for you. You can have it for Christmas. You know you're going to get penalized for some of your stupidity, don't you? Oh, 
I know. I was naive and stupid. I know that, and I've learned okay. my lesson. All right. When you got the bill, how much was the bill from the credit card? I have authorized and unauthorized charges in September and October. You have the bill for September? Mm-hmm. I want to see it. Okay. Now let me see October statement. This is all his stuff? Mm-hmm. All of his stuff? Mm -hmm. What are you, out of your mind? <laughs> what are you, out of your mind? I guess so. No, you're not. You're just a spoiled brat. Paid your credit card bill, paid your Sprint bill, you went to the drugstore, you filled up your car with gas, bought yourself a pair of shoes. Tiffany and company? He bought me my promise ring on my credit card. <laughs> Who bought jeans? She wanted me to get jeans to go away to Florida to meet her parents. You actually took him to meet your parents? Yeah. What'd they say? We'll see. Is that what they said to you? Mm -hmm. We'll see? They said you're smart. I know you make the right decisions. And, you know, it's your relationship. You have to live it. Now let's get to the close, Miss Hendershot. So after he didn't pay you back this and you saw that he was abusing your trust in October, you went out and you did something really stupid. Mm -hmm. You continued to see him. You continued to be involved with him. And in January of 2006, you do what? I bought him suits for his new job. He was a salesman, so he needed suits. So I offered to buy him. He agreed. We went to the store, and we bought him together. And he lost a job a couple weeks later. Started another job. Lost that. I never saw a paycheck from the first job. He had an agreement that the paychecks would go to me for the suits. I never agreed to have taken the suits. I never even wanted the suits. She just wanted me to be some white-collar business guy. I mean, we'd go to the stores, and she'd offer to buy them, and I was like, I don't want them. And she'll sit there and pick a fight with me, so I'll just let her do whatever she wanted. What about this stuff, sir? These are your purchases. You had the card at that time. The shoes are not my purchases, and um, only one guess is mine. Take this over, please, Bird, to Mr. Gleason. Have him look at that. And tell me what he acknowledges. You see, Mr. Gleason, listen to me very carefully, sir. It's clear to me that there was only one card. And that one card, I believe, was in your possession. Now, understanding that, you may go through that bill and tell me what's not yours. But be prepared to be grilled, Mr. Gleason. Grilled, sauteed, <laughs> and poached. <laughs> All right. The things that you circled are yours or not yours? Not mine. The thing oh, okay. that I checked is the one that she wanted me to go down to Florida with the uh, jeans. And I she never... can't wear your jeans, sir. What your statement is that these were all gifts. Is that yes. right? Yes, ma'am. Wrong. Mm -hmm. Did you tell him that the TV for his car was a gift Christmas time? No. I said, I'm going to pay it off since you don't have the money right now, but when you get a job, I'd like the money because I didn't want it on my credit card balance. Well, you can't have it on your credit card, otherwise you'll have credit like he did when he went to Iraq and his <laughs> girlfriend racked up all those charges. <laughs> she didn't make that up, did she? That you told her you had a girlfriend and that... My ex did rack up my credit card. When you were in Iraq? <laughs> huh? No. So you lied about that? Yes. When you lied to her about that, did you lie to her convincingly? Kind of, because she wanted it in No, don't tell me what she wanted. I want you to tell me like you told her, just like you told her. I was in Iraq, and my girlfriend maxed out my credit cards, and so I have lousy credit. I want you to tell me exactly how you told that to her. I said, when I was... Look, look at me. Like, because you looked at her in the eye, right? Kind of. Tell me what you said to her, just like I'm looking at you. I said to her, my ex-girlfriend racked up my credit card while I was away in Iraq. Did you tell her how you paid off the credit cards? Oh, I still have them going on dispute. Why do you have them going on dispute? Because she took my credit card without my permission. I gave it to her once, her pay off her credit card. Yes. And then she took my credit card mm -hmm. without me, like, physically handing it to her. Right. And then I started getting bills in the mail. How'd you feel I, about that? I mean, it hurt, but... How badly did it hurt? 50%, I guess. 50%. If you had 100% of a brain, it probably would have hurt you 100%. Since you only have 50% of a brain, it only hurt you 50%. Now, when you got the first bill, did you confront your girlfriend? At the time, I tried to confront her, but what? she kept hanging up. 
Did you sue her? No. Did you call the police? I filed a report on it. You did? So you were really angry? Yes, ma'am. Because somebody took advantage of you? Yes, ma'am. Somebody took your credit card, somebody who you trusted, your girlfriend, and racked up a whole bunch of bills and ruined your young credit, right? Yes, ma'am. So what'd you feel? You had the right to do it to somebody else? Uh, no. Figure if a girl can do it to a guy, a guy can do it to a girl. Yes. Mr. Gleason, if I were your grandmother, your bag would be packed on the front porch by the time I got home. It's time you grew up because you're a user. You're using the federal government to support yourself when there's no reason for it. You look like an able-bodied, strong, well-nourished 21-year-old. <laughs> you're taking advantage of your grandmother who's living on a small pension and cleaning other people's houses to take care of you. And you took advantage of this young lady who cared for you, wanted only the best for you. You are, Mr. Gleason, at this point in your life, a bum. The sooner you start correcting it, the sooner you're going to be not a bum. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. Judge for the plaintiff in the amount of $5,000. That's all. Lee Icuzzi says former friend Dean Pottle assaulted him. Dean claims he was only protecting himself. Ms. Iacuzzi, it is your claim that the defendant assaulted you. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Before we get started, my pronoun is he. I made that clear. My name is Lee and I, my pronoun is he. And, and I didn't see that. I have Lisa. Yeah, also known as Lee Iacuzzi. Okay. I'm a trans. It is your claim that the defendant assaulted you, Mr. Iacuzzi, and the defendant says that quite the contrary, it was you who assaulted him. How do you know each other? I met Dean Pottle uh, seven, when I was the Portland International Hostel Manager and I was in charge of the facilities at the time and I also lived there. Dean came to my residence uh, at the hostel looking for work. He was actually homeless at the time and I took him in. All right, so that's how you met him? Yep. When did this alleged assault take place? April 2nd, 2005. Tell me the circumstances, please. I had a business transaction with Dean Pottle that failed. He was supposed to do a plumbing job for me in exchange for me mowing a lawn for him. I also had $1,000 with the oil paintings in his house that we were going to exchange for him to do plumbing services. I went over to his house uh, two times. Both times I brought uh, my witness, and on the second time I was assaulted. Tell me how you were assaulted. Uh, I brought my friend Buddy. There was a driveway that separated Buddy, Dean, and myself. I was leaning back on the car that was separated about four feet of driveway to Dean's house. Uh, Dean was arguing with Buddy. Uh, I told Dean that I was going to tell everybody that he's bisexual. And he ran two big full steps. It just pushed his arm, swung me around into the car. Just a minute. You went very quickly. Yes. You said you ran two steps? No. I was leaning against the car here, and there was Dean's house. Just a second. First, you threatened to tell people that he was a bisexual? Right, because he harassed me. How was he harassing you when you came to his house? I was at his house to collect money and my oil paintings. I didn't hear how he was harassing you. He harassed me three days before, and I was still upset about the incident. And I well, how did he harass you three days before? Um, I was at his house. I was massaging his hands. He went into the bathroom to take off his shirt to massage his shoulders. He came out butt naked and asked me to play with his so then why would you go back to his house? Well, I brought a witness with me because I had $1,000 with the paintings that Did I Did you get your brokered. paintings? At, at the second time that I arrived at the defendant's house, I did get my paintings. Then what I'm asking you is, why did you have any exchange with him at all if you had your paintings? On the day, within the hour of the assault, at the beginning of the assault, I came in, brought a friend, asked him to go get my paintings, which I needed. So we went and got your paintings? Right. While I was getting my paintings, Dean came outside. Just a second. Your paintings are in the car? If all three of you were there... Paintings are in the car. So now they're in the car? Right. Why aren't you in the car leaving? Because he owes me more money. He owes me money. Untrue. He owes money from doing a plumbing job that he refuses to pay me. So I'm asking for my money. He refuses to pay Put me. Put your hand down, please. He refuses to pay me. And we have a verbal exchange. We've been friends for seven years. I was really upset at what he did to me. I'm going through this transition. I felt he was taking advantage of me. Keep going. And words were exchanged. He walked two steps up to me and pushed me into a car. I swung back and got him off me. And when you swung back, you hit him. Well, he was on top of me. <laughs> he was on top of me. He pushed me into a car, and he was on top of me. 
How was he on top of you? I have fingerprints. He pushed me like this, and he was on top of me right here when he pushed me. I leaned back, and I hit him. I only defended myself. Let me hear what happened, sir. Well, when I followed him out with the paintings, and the car was out on the street, and I stood back at my driveway, probably 20 feet away from the car. He, when he went toward the car to put the paintings in the street, she came out of the vehicle and came toward me. Now, she was nowhere near a vehicle. Now, she came toward me very aggressively and yelling profanities and everything else. So I instinctively put my hand out to defend myself. And when she came close to me, I went like this and said, get out of Portland, because I felt she, was, she didn't belong in our uh, environment there. And I turned to look at him, and he says, oh, you touched her first. And when I looked back, she went, bam, like this. <laughs> Right, right against my lip here. And I staggered back, yelled at don't, me, and that's hey, when she left. First of all, sit up. Second of all, don't speak until I speak to you. Okay. Do you have a photograph of your injury? No, I don't. Do you have a photograph of your injury? I have documentation of a medical records. I'd like to see it, please. Now you can step up, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Tell me your name. My name is Buddy Burkew. Spell your last name. B-E-R-C-U, it's Romanian. Left hand, left arm, kind of Bruce. Difficult the oh. first time. Anyways. All right, now, the, um, I ask questions. Okay, yes, go ahead. I ask questions. Please. The paintings are in the car. Okay, the paintings are in the car. I come back. He comes out, and the car is parked right by the driveway. Who's in the car? <clears throat> no one's in the car. They're both arguing with each other, and I'm like, okay, let, the vent, let them vent a little bit and get some of this out, you know, because... Just a second. When I don't were want to they as you were putting the paint... I'm speaking. You're not paying attention to me. When they were putting the paint... The paintings were already the, in the I, car, you listen said. Listen to me. Okay. Listen. Try. I'm trying. Putting on your listening ears. Uh, I will. You're putting the paintings in the car. That's correct. And he's letting you take the paintings. That's correct. Now the last of the paintings is in the car, right? That's correct. Why didn't you both get in the car and leave? Because, Your Honor, this isn't about that. It's about the disrespect and, and the way that the abuse had gone down in the first place. And he had not You're said he was sorry. You're talking about this incident three days before that Lee has just described to me. Apparently, Lee hadn't worked through the whole incident yet, Your Honor. Then she, he, excuse me, was angry. That's correct, Your Honor. Got it. Go See how easy it is to get to the truth? Can I, can I give you yeah, some more truth, no, or do no. you want? Can I get to the truth? Absolutely. Can you give me some more bold facts, sir? Yes, sir. I yes, determine what the truth is. I, I understand that. You understand? You're the judge. Okay. So far, we have somebody who wanted their paintings made three trips got the paintings but according to you and your lee's witness mm -hmm. lee wasn't finished being angry about something that happened three days before and wanted an apology that's correct your honor okay. and then what happened was he said instead of I have a restraining order on you or get out of my property he said get out of portland which i thought was a little bit wide of a swath for his powers. I mean, Portland's a big yes. place. Yes. Then he approached, like, he, what he did was he just said, basically, get out of Portland, get out of Portland. And the third get out of Portland, he, like, rushed like he was doing a uh, shot put. And just the whole body, everything came through, but not upward, but straight, like a, like a thrust, and, and hit. And I could see that she grimaced in pain, and she was crying out. And then what happened simply is a counterattack just to save face, because I would imagine transitioning to become a man you have to prove to other men you're a man. So I, that's why I stayed away from this up until this point. I didn't feel there was any danger up to that point where I had to intervene. I got some heat for that. Say, like, well, you know, I should have just kicked his, you know, I wasn't going to do that. So anyway, I don't think violence solves anything. And at, at any rate, what happened was he said, you can't hit me. Or you can't hit me, I'll kill you. Or something, I don't remember what it was exactly. Something to that effect. Just was really surprised that Lee would counterattack. And then I just stepped in and said, look, you know, you hit Lee first. And just kind of diffuse him. Did you see his bloody lip? No, he had no bloody lip. There was no. It, it was the uh, the hand. She was like, you know, like this because you know, it was not a closed fist. And I never use a fist because you could not close I'm it. I might ask interested whether you use a fist. But I'm, or not. I'm just saying, you know, it, you can hurt I'm your hands. Okay. Shh, I'm not interested whether you use a you fist or not. It's you. not yes, particularly relevant you. here. I want you to stop. Huh? You're going to be making a fool of yourself. I want you to stop. Shh. You. I apologize. If You're I killing don't. me. Right. When was the first time that you were prescribed Vicodin? I've had an ongoing neck and conditioning. Right. I sense. see that. So you had all kinds of problems that you were prescribed Vicodin for and all kinds of other pain medication. Right. 
Listen, you both behave badly. You're not supposed to hit her. She's not supposed to come on to your property aggressively, which is exactly what she did. You're not supposed to push her. You're not supposed to punch him. It's over. Finished. Who has an order of protection? Either one of you? I'm going to get one from both of them. Well, that's a very, very good idea, sir. Thank you. And do me a favor, get one for me, too. That's all. Why does I excuse you? Daycare provider Samantha Burks says former client Lillian Linton owes for breaking their contract. Lillian claims Samantha left her kids unattended in a parked car. She is countersuing for child neglect. I've read your complaint, which alleges that the defendant breached a written contract that you had with her for child care. At some point, she terminated your services, you say, without good cause. She owes you some money. And in addition, she filed false charges against you with Child Protective Services, which required them to investigate your home, investigate whether or not you should continue to be licensed as a child care provider. Yeah. Ms. Linton says that she took her children out of your care because you placed them in a situation that could have been dangerous. And she is counterclaiming yes. for the potential harm that you did to her children. So when did she take the children out of your care? On the 1st of July. Tell me what monies you allege she owes you. Um, I'm alleging she owes me all that is paid through the county. She called me and gave me a two-week notice and didn't fulfill it. She gave you two weeks notice when? The day after in question. It, I guess it would be the 2nd of July. On or about July 1st? Well, may I tell you a little bit previously? Because um, I had not been keeping her kids. The end of school had come. And so we started making arrangements again for me to start keeping her children again. Miss Linton leaves her children home alone. I only was keeping her youngest son. Shh. Don't interrupt her. I just want to know what happened on 7-1. Okay. The day in question, I picked her children up. How many children? I picked all four of them up. How old are they? They're 13, 9, 6, and 1. Is that your son? Yes. How old are you? 12. Is that the one that you said was 13? Yes, I was told he was 13. You're 12? Yes. 12, 9, 6, and 1? 12, 8, 6, and 1. Okay. Go ahead. So you picked up her children, four children. I picked up her children, and the, and the day in question, I had, to, I had a class I have to take. There are certain requirements through the county that you have to take classes. So I had a class. Um, Lori McMillan's a friend of mine, and I have her watch them. She's watched her kids many times before. Is Miss McMillan a licensed daycare provider? No. Are you permitted under your contract with the state to leave the children with unlicensed daycare providers? Yes. You are? That, that, that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. I've never... Shh. Listen. I don't need any help, and this isn't a tea dance. Not that you're aware of. Not that I'm not aware of, exactly. Oh, okay. So, Ms. Burks, did you have to take classes in order to be a child care provider? Yes. You... Did they do a background check? Yes. Criminal background check. They did fingerprinting? Yep. Photographing? Yep. So you went through a process before the government says we will pay you money to watch children. To get my license, you go through that process. That's right. Mm -hmm. To get your license as a child care provider, you must go through this process. Yes, ma'am. She didn't go through the process. Okay. So nobody has to tell you that she's not permitted to take care of the children. No. I'm telling you that unless you are vetted by the state so that you can get a license. You can't give over the care of four children to somebody else. I understand that now. Good. What happened next? Well, I, I haven't even gotten to the beginning of that day because I, I would like to tell you the whole day. I want you to tell me what happened when you left the children in a car. That's what that, this that's, is all that's about. That's what I'm trying to get to. Well, then get there. Okay. On the day of question, I picked her children up. I went to the county building, had some paperwork to drop off for my father. I take care of my father, who is terminally ill, dying of cancer. Um, after that, I went and picked up Gloria McMillan to watch the children for me. On the way home, I stopped past the party store. Getting out of the car, I said, guys, you guys wait right here. I'm going to run in the party store real quick. Let my daughter pick out her party invitations. And we proceeded into the store. I left their children in the car. And on my way out of the car... Where was she? She went into the store to speak to a, a friend of hers that worked at the uh, register in the store. How old is your daughter? My daughter is two now. The daughter who is picking up? Yeah. I have a very bright two-year-old. Just a sec. What two-year-old would you aiming? I'll give you this last opportunity. Then you're going out. Do you understand? Mm-hmm. Yes. So let me understand this. First, you went to take care of some business for your father, who you take care of. Mm hmm And you took the children with you. Mm-hmm. Had this lady been watching the children yet? No, she that was day? not with me. Just a second. Who was with the children when you dropped the paperwork off? I was with the children. Did they come into the county building with Actually, you? Actually, no, they oh. stayed outdoors and played. 
I never thought any of this to be a problem at all, Miss Linton. Well, Miss Burks, it's a problem. That's what we're doing now. I'm and going I, over the day. I understand. I'm this going over the day because it's getting worse as no, we go this forward. No, already worse. I understand what Judge, I did was completely just, wrong. Well, if you understand that, then Miss Burks, I don't quite understand why you're here. Because from what I'm I read in the complaint, Miss Linton is slandering my name. Just a second. If what you're telling me is you picked up her children and you had your two-year-old in the car. You went to the county building. Mm -hmm. Did you take your two-year-old inside with you? To the county building, yes, ma'am, and her son. Shh. And her 12-year-old or no, her one-year-old? Her, her littlest son. They stay outside and play Shh. basketball. You went inside and you took your two-year-old and her one-year-old into the county building. And her other three children stayed outside alone. And played on the playground. I don't care where they played. They stayed outside alone. Yes, ma'am. And then you come back to the car and you went and picked up this lady. Yes. And then two adults, your daughter, went inside to a store and you left her four children in the car, including the one-year-old. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And how long were you in the store? Maybe five minutes. So that's what the case is about. It was the next day that she called and gave you notice. Right, but that's not what she called me and said the next day. What did she call you and say the next day? She called me on the phone when I answered. I said, hello. She says, I'm giving you a two-week notice because you have a problem with my son. I said, no, ma'am, I don't have a problem with your liar. son. Your son is a child. You're a liar. No, no, no. Listen to me. Miss Linton, don't speak to her. Okay, go ahead. I said, no, ma'am, I don't have a problem with your son. Your son is a child. Your son has a problem with following adult supervision. And this is not the first incident that I had an issue with her son. I said to her, your children were throwing rocks. And I asked them to stop. When I asked them to stop, her son looked over at me and said, I'm not throwing rocks, just like that, with a handful of rocks. So I said, I'll just call your mom. Um, when I called her on the phone, she said, um, let me see if I can remember her exact words. Uh, they know I don't play that. I'm going to beat that when they get home. <laughs> I said, okay, I'm just letting you know, it's not acceptable in my house. People have nice things around here. I don't want to be responsible for anything that happens. And that was it. We got off the phone. Later that evening, I had to have my father rush to the hospital. I was under a lot of stress. Her kids were still outdoors, not paying me any mind, not listening to anything I said. And um, when she got there, you could see the agitation in her face, you know. Where and, does your um, father live? He lives with me. Ms. Brooks, your plate is too full. I agree with you. I agree. I agree with you. Now. When you accept the responsibility of taking care of someone else's children, you have to take care of them sometimes better than their own parents take I do, care of I them. I did. No, no, no. Listen to me. If you have five children, I made a very two, big mistake and I would never do it again. You I've have learned five. My life. Listen to me. I'm not even going there. The car, totally, 100% unacceptable. And she had every right to, to call Child Protective Services and say, you left four children in the car, including a one-year-old child, and I'm complaining about that. I never said she was wrong about she, that. What she's wrong well, about you, is that she wants to point the finger at me when she's a bad mother herself. She leaves her children home Ms. daily. Burks, Ms. Burks, listen to me. If we were involved in some other forum, I would say to you, fine, we can vent upon who's a better mother, who's a bad mother, who's a good mother. We're here because you sued her for two things, for money for child care mm -hmm. and for filing a false report mm -hmm. to Child Protective Services. Mm -hmm. Whether she's a good mother, whether she's a bad mother, whether she's a wicked stepmother, whatever she is, she did the right thing by calling Child Protective Services to report that you had left the children alone. Your plate is very full. When you accept children into your home as a child care provider, you're supposed to do more with those children than just be a body there. You're supposed to play with them. You're supposed to provide them with activity. With are you. you. No, no, me no, 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 listen to me. No, no, what, what I'm do. telling you is, if you have a two-year-old toddler yourself, and a father who is terminally ill with cancer that you're caring for in your home, it is impossible to set up a home, your home, to be an appropriate and adequate child care provider. Well, so, Judy, that's your opinion. I disagree. And my father was not diagnosed with lung cancer when I took care of her children. Through the process of taking care of her children, he was diagnosed with lung cancer. You told me the story, madam. You said I had to drop some papers off for my father who was dying of cancer, who I was also caring for. You told that to me. But you're saying to me... I'm saying to you, people, in general, with your own day. children, that day... Okay, yes, ma'am, okay. That day, that's all you need is one day. That's all you need is one day 
to miss a child. You know, they missed a couple of children on another coast, and they ended up in the trunk of a car. I have to investigate it myself. Let, There's a listen, lot of bad things that listen, happen to children that get left in cars, and I'm very absolutely. aware of Absolutely. Ended never, up in trunks ever, of car, and they ever didn't get them in time. Do it again. So what I would never do it again. So you don't belong in court, Miss Burke. Yes, ma'am, I do. Miss Lulinton is going around town saying bad things about me. I am not a bad person. Just a second. If you have information or witnesses that she's saying anything about you scandalous that have to do with other than your child care abilities, I'll be more than happy to hear witnesses to that. What do you mean? Well, I don't know what, if she's saying things about you, about your personal life, that you have a disease, that you're No, she's thief. just basically in a nutshell saying that I'm a bad person. Her, her exact words was that I'm not cracked up to all that I'm supposed to be. Listen to me. That's her opinion. And she can say that, and not all speech is actionable in a court. What you did as a child care provider was wrong, so you have no basis to sue her for either the money that you claim she owes you or for calling Child Protective Services. None. She's got a counterclaim. Your counterclaim is that she left your four children in the car. Yes. Were any of them hospitalized? No, they weren't just, hospitalized. Just listen to me. I have questions. Any of them treated by a physician that day or the next day? No. Okay, so they suffered no injury. Who are you? I had the kids the following day, and the one-year-old was um, throwing up two to three times. You're a liar. And I have never seen this one before. She did not have the one-year-old the next day. I kept her son overnight. I am a licensed I kept her son overnight. I would say one, two, three. So far, you have no case. That's fine. I, I don't care if I don't have a case. Good. She will not sit here on national TV and lie about me. I kept her You're son overnight, you liar. Miss Burks, I've already explained in a calm fashion why I'm dismissing your case. That's Ms. fine. Linton, Ms. Linton, yes. you have no counterclaim against her. You have no proof that her actions caused illness to any of your children. You were perfectly within your rights to take them out of her care. Her illness and I'm speaking. Nasty. I'm speaking. And... You were perfectly within your rights to call Child Protective Services to report the neglect. Other than that, you have no claim against her because her actions, while they placed your children in potential harm's way, did not cause any injury to your children. Your counterclaims dismissed. She puts That's all. Step out. Harm's way every She's day a liar. She's home alone. Liar. That Please her. excuse me. Step out. That's it. Juliette Basacio is suing her ex-boyfriend, Omar Pierce, for unpaid rent and a security deposit. Omar says Juliet is angry that he went back to his wife. Ms. Fasacio, this very unhappy gentleman who's standing next to you, Mr. Pierce, used to be your boyfriend, yes. even though he was married. And you have a child together. Yes. Mistake number two. And it is your claim that the two of you leased an apartment for six months because you claim Mr. Pierce wanted to move out of your parents' home where you, the two of you were living with your baby and have a place of your own. You signed the six months lease. He didn't really hold up his end of the rent, which you had agreed to. And then he moved out, leaving you stuck with the lease. Mr. Pierce says that you couldn't rip him from the heart of his wife and two sons and that he decided to go home and that he paid rent while he lived there, right? Yes, ma'am. Did I explain your position, sir? No, I don't owe, I don't owe any, any of the money. What? I don't owe any money. Oh, this is going to be harder than I thought. <laughs> when did he live in your parents' house? The first time he moved in was in May. Of 2006? Yes. How old is your baby? He's two and a half. He'll be three in October. Is that your only child? Yes. Why would you have a baby with somebody who's married? Because he lied and told me he wasn't married. He He's... told me he had just separated and he was, he was divorced from his wife six months prior to when I met him. He said he was separated or divorced? The same difference. He said... No, it's not the same difference. Separated is not divorced. At first, he didn't have a wife. I would have never went with him if he told me that he was married. He knows. And when did he finally tell you he was married? He never did. He never told me that he was married. I had to find out from She's his wife married. that he was married. And it was after I had my son. Was he living with you? Mm -mm. No, he wasn't. Why wasn't he living with you? I don't know. Did you ask him why we're not living together? No. Did you ask him why we're not married? No, I, I, he knows that I wouldn't want to marry him. <laughs> I told him, I don't want to get married. Why do I need to get married? If I, if I live with somebody, why would I need to get married? Well, why if you're fighting with somebody? You're right, you shouldn't marry somebody you're fighting with, right? 
You also shouldn't make a baby with them. That was before I found out that he was married. What difference does it make if he's married or not? If you don't want to get married and you're not getting along with him. We were not fighting before that. Everything was fine before that. There was no fighting or nothing. You mean everything was fine until you got pregnant? Yes. Well, he was okay up until the month I had my baby. What kind of work do you do? I'm a receiving clerk. Where? I, w I don't want to say. In what city? In San Marcos. How long have you been a shipping clerk for the company that you work for now? Close to a year. And before that, where did you work? Oh, uh, I didn't work. Huh? I didn't work. Oh, I did work, but in, <laughs> in numerous places. What kind of work does the plaintiff do? I work in the emergency room. What kind of work does the plaintiff do? She works in a hospital, I guess. What do you mean you guess? Why I see her go there. I mean, yes, yeah, she works in a hospital. Excuse me, I don't want to be... Yeah, smart. don't be a smart Alex, sir. You know, you're having trouble just keeping your head above water here. <laughs> and what prompted you to decide to get an apartment with him? Because now you're living with your parents and your son, right? Everything is nice. The baby has some stability, live at home, so he's got grandparents, nice. Now you know he's married, and he says, let's get an apartment together. He's the father of my child. I'm going to give him a chance. If I'm, if I'm going to want him in my son's life, I'm going to give him that chance. He told me that he was in the process already of divorcing his wife. Two weeks before we signed our lease, before we were going to move in together, he told me that his divorce was going to be final. That obviously was So you was signed the true. lease. Can I see the lease, please? Yes, you may. <sighs> November of 2006 is when you started. When did he move out? In January of 2007. So he lived there with you for two months, right? Yes. Excuse What? We moved in in October, and I gave her rent for October. It says that the rent is due the first date of each month beginning November 2nd. Thank you. It's November. Your lease started November 2nd. Yes. 2006. Why did you move out? I went back with my wife and kids. Went home. You went back with your wife and kids. Well, what did you expect her to do with this apartment? Well, she told me before we get, uh, moved into the place that I can go, go back to my family, go back to break the lease, hey, and go back to my family. Me, Just a second. She what? <laughs> Say it again to me. She told so me, I believe it. <laughs> she told me that I can, if it didn't work, I could break the lease. And I, I go back to your wife. Yes. Those words never came out of a woman's mouth. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Not her mouth. Thank you. Especially not with just somebody a, with a kid. Just a second. Don't in. Don't look at me. Those words not only didn't come out of her mouth, they didn't come out of any woman's mouth in history. If it doesn't work out between us, you can break the lease and go back to your wife. Yeah, because she knew how I, how I felt about my wife and her. What, are you crazy? <laughs> Why did you sign this lease, Mr. Pierce? Because I wanted it to be free. I thought it was going to work out between me and her. Because what? I wanted it to be free. I wanted, you know, because we would have fun. I thought it would be, you know, work out with me and Juliet. So you wanted to have fun. You couldn't have fun in her parents' house. We agreed to move out so we could be together. You wanted to be free. Yeah, well, You wanted for to many... be able to drink and smoke and do what you wanted to do and have a good time. You couldn't do that at her parents' house. And her parents probably looked at you like I'm looking at you and saying, why? I raised this nice girl and she brings me home a bum. Why? What happened? <laughs> Mr. Pierce. You have a responsibility to pay her for the remainder of the lease, your half. Do you want me to explain why to you, sir? No. No? Well, because I don't, I, don't I don't owe her any money. <laughs> when I stayed there, she said that it was OK, you know, because I, I, she knew I had to uh, support my uh, other kids. You know, when I was a kid, my grandmother used to tell me that, you know, God one day gave, God gave you a heart, one day a soul, one day you got a brain, one day you got Mm. <laughs> he was absent. He picked the wrong day to be absent, Mr. Pierce. Listen to what I'm saying you, to you, sir. You have three children. You made three children. You can't afford to have three children. You probably can't even afford to take care of yourself. So you have to find some other hobby other than having children. That's number one. Number two, sir, look over here. You signed a lease. That has meaning. Whether you pay taxes or not is not my issue. Signing this contract is my issue. Do you understand, sir? Yes. Signing this contract obligated her to pay this rent. Now, if they can't come after you because they can't find you, that is a problem. 
Do we understand each other, Mr. Pierce? Yes, ma'am. You understand me loud and clear now, Mr. Pierce? Yes, ma'am. Good. I'm glad now we understand each other, sir. So when you sign a lease for six months with the mother of your child and take her out of a home where she's living relatively comfortably, rent-free, and then you get an epiphany and want to be near your other baby's mother, that doesn't mean you are absolved from paying her for the rent. Do you understand, sir? If Uncle Sam can't find you, I can. Do we understand each other? Yes, ma'am. Very good. The rent is $825. According to your complaint, he was supposed to pay $400. $400 times 4 equals $1,600. That's for the four months remaining on the lease after you moved out, sir. Do you understand? Yes. Goodbye. Judgment for the plaintiff. That's right. 22-year-old Ted Boyer is suing his ex-roommate, 21-year-old Chris Figelwitz, for vandalizing his property, the return of a security deposit, and an assault. Order. All rise. Yeah, this is case number 321 on the calendar in the matter of Boyer versus you. Figglewitch. You're welcome. Parties have been sworn in, Judge. You may be seated. Ladies, have a seat. Mr. Boyer, how long were you and the defendant roommates? Um, for approximately six months. Were you going to school? Yes. What school? Golden West College. What were you studying? Uh, graphic design. And you? Uh, I go to Musicians Institute. Were you friends before you moved in together? Yes, I am. <laughs> Quick study. This is your complaint, Mr. Boyer, that this idiot decided to play a little prank on you and sprayed your room with urine, destroying your mattress and your computer. Now, Mr. Figglewitz says it was just a little urine, and it could not possibly have destroyed your mattress because he just got it on the edge of the comforter. Yep. Yes, Judge Judith. And that it certainly did not go on the computer. In addition, on the same day, he assaulted you and you were injured. You have photographs to show me. Yes, ma'am. And in addition to that, after you, because immediately after this you moved out, mm -hmm. you never got your security deposit back. Now, the defendant says he never assaulted you and you didn't get your security deposit back because you didn't come and clean up the apartment, right? Yes, that's true. And also, he. Uh didn't pay all his bills either. I don't have a counterclaim. Okay. When did you move in? August 2004. And when was this incident with the urine? Late February. Tell me what happened. It's kind of a funny story. Um, I came home from work one night and they were out partying and there was probably like four or five people over and it was a common occurrence at the house. There was always a lot of people over and at that time I was working and going to school so it wasn't my you know, main point of interest to be partying all the time. And I just become fed up with it after a while. So I was staying at my girlfriend's house, Asia, for you know the, the last three months because of not only the pranks that were going on, plus the partying. So I decided I'm going to get out of here. I don't want to deal with this tonight. So I take a couple of uh, DVDs over to Asia's house, and we're going to go watch them. I come back because I forgot the ones that we were, we meant to watch and uh, find the defendant, Mr. Figowitz, in my room coming out with a spray bottle and laughing. I was there. Yes. Yeah. And so, obviously, we're like, what are you doing in my room? That's inappropriate in the first place. And he just laughs and runs outside. And we're like, where are you going? What are you running outside? So we come out, we go outside, and he's obviously drunk at this point. So I begin to ask him what he was doing. Ultimately, I get him to admit that he was spraying urine in my room out of a spray bottle. And, uh, just a second, just a second. Yes. How did it get in the spray bottle? Uh, you know, you can use your imagination. I don't want to use my imagination. Uh, I, I went want in you the to bathroom tell and filled it up. How much of the spray bottle? Maybe. Show me how big the spray bottle was. It was like this big. I maybe filled up that much. And then did you put some water in it? No. So it was straight urine. Yeah. See, the reason I don't like to use my imagination is if you do something stupid, I like 10 million people to hear that you've done something stupid. That's my joy in life. <laughs> when did this idea foment in your brain that I'm going to go into the bathroom and instead of urinating in the toilet like most people do, I'm going to go to the bathroom and get a spray bottle, whatever was in the spray bottle, I'm going to dump out. And then I'm going to fill this up and I'm, I want to know, 
when during the course of the evening did that idea foment in your brain? It was pretty spontaneous. It was spontaneous because you had had enough to drink to make it spontaneous? No. Were you annoyed at Mr. Boyer? A little bit, but uh... Okay, so you were a little annoyed. Yeah. What were you annoyed about, sir? You're never gonna know where I'm going, so don't try to figure it out, sir. You think I'm gonna zig and I guarantee you I'm gonna go the other way. So just try telling me the truth, you'll be a much happier person. Mm -hmm. And much less embarrassed. I mean, there was pranks on both parts. Like, I found a can that's beneath my mattress, between my box spring. When was that? Uh, a few days before. Had you done that? No. How did you know it was him? Because I had my other roommate, and he told me it was, so... Maybe it was your other roommate trying to get off the hook. Could be, but Could be, I doubt right? it. Okay. Why else were you mad at him? I was felt uh, unappreciated because <laughs> I, paid, I paid for everything. I... Uh, furnished the whole place and spent like five thousand dollars on all new stuff and he would always comment that my furniture was tacky or whatever or my paintings were so first he did a prank you thought on you but really you were annoyed with him yeah because he didn't appreciate you enough i appreciate you <laughs> let me see pictures i didn't hear about the assault yet um after I basically caught him red-handed, um, we went outside and we were having an argument and some of my friends were, or his friends, were intervening to make sure nothing physical started to happen. Obviously, I wasn't going to try to do anything. That's not my character. So he comes around and kicks me. We were standing on stairs, mind you, or he was standing two stairs above me, kicks me and I stumbled down, knocked my hand on a beer bottle, it broke and shattered in my arm. That's untrue. And I also have a police report. Can I see it, please? Yes. So you got some scratches on your arms, no stitches, is that right? Um, no stitches. Okay. Um, I did, I wasn't able to go to work the next day. I wait tables, or I did wait tables at the time, so it's obviously inappropriate to have open wounds. Miss Asia, step up, please. I want you to tell me what you observed outside. Okay. Chris went out of the house after we approached him about the situation. We were upset about it because that's disgusting. I sleep there too. Um, I was standing right there on top of the stairs. Ted was on the stairs as well. His friends started getting between the two of them. Then finally something was said and Ted or Chris kicked Ted and then Ted went down the stairs. Where did he kick him? He kicked him, probably hit him about your waist or hip. Oh, in the with his stomach. With his foot. With his foot. Yeah. Because that's where he, he could reach him. Ted flew forward and then hit his arm on the wall where the beer bottle was. Go ahead. That's not how it really happened. I ran out, I went in the bathroom and then I walked outside and then she was, you know, saying like, you know, Ted's twice my size, he's gonna kick my excuse me. You know, then he, he was angry and he came at me and in defending myself, I pushed him away with my foot and he scraped his arm on the stucco That's wall. That's not true, Shh. Um, I didn't have any glass in it or anything. I guess he knocked over a beer bottle, but there was no glass in his arm or anything like that. I heard the whole thing, too, Your Honor. Well, I'd like you to stand up and tell me your name. I'm Katie Carlson, and I was in the room when he sprayed the urine. What were you doing in the room? Laughing. Well, that's stupid. I know. It was stupid. How drunk were you? I wasn't drunk at all. And Chris had probably had, like, two beers. He wasn't drunk either. You mean he did this act of stupidity sober? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. So I was in the room and... I'm just interested in what happened outside. Okay. Uh, when Ted walked in, I had been in the room with Chris and I walked Listen out. Listen to so me I... very carefully, my dear. Okay. Get out to the stairs. So I heard Ted and Asia both just really violently harassing Chris. They were both saying that Ted's twice your size. He's, he's going to kick your... And Chris was just totally like, you know, I'm sorry. I admit it. I'm sorry. And uh, Ted came up the stairs at Chris... Chris put his foot out, defended him. Start. Just a second, stop. Were you outside or did you hear this? I, I did not see the fight. So don't tell me what you saw well, if I you heard, didn't okay. see anything. I heard them yelling and harassing him and I heard Chris admitting fault, apologizing, and he was making such below the belt comments. Just listen to me. Right. Did you see no. anything? No. Then you may sit down. Okay. What? <laughs> oh, you know, sometimes some of these cases that we do it makes me not want to buy government bonds. <sighs> what happened to your computer? Well, after the whole occurrence... Lo 
what happened to your computer. It didn't work. Had it worked before? Yes. Untrue. That's untrue. You've got a lot of things that are untrue. He, we only had one computer hooked up to the internet because his didn't work, and he used my roommate's computer all the time because his computer never worked. Does that sound right? I didn't have Don't play. I Don't didn't play. have internet on my computer. Okay, but the computer, but the computer itself, computer itself, itself didn't work. work. Do you have a bill true. to fix the computer? Yeah, well, I bought an, I threw that computer away simply because urine, the urine stench was on it. It was disgusting. And I bought a new computer. I don't expect to get the full amount for my new computer. I just want to be compensated for, you know, what the old computer was worth. Well, what was it worth? I was waiting for you to judge on that. I don't even know how to turn on a computer. <laughs> I have no idea what your old computer cost. I have no idea of what its value was. And you don't come into court asking the judge to figure out what that is. You have some sort of proof for me to look at. Yes, I Do you I understand? Have... Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. You are suing Mr. Figglewitz for $5,000. Yes. Okay, how much was your deposit? $733. All right, so that you're going to get back from him because he had a good reason to move out because Mr. Figglewitz and his friends, including this young lady, were idiots. Okay? The check was never Shops. made to me. I don't care. It's your fault that he finally left. Then he's going to pay you $1,000 for the fall and the scraped arm because even though you didn't have glass in your arm, it's something that you don't have to tolerate. And I absolutely believe, Miss Asia over here, that your friends were in between the two of you. You were both hot. And that while the four of you, you kicked him and caused him to fall. And you cannot, sir, do that. The mattress. Did you buy a new mattress? Yes. How much did you spend on it? $500. You have a bill? No, I don't. I have, um... Price. Different uh, like prices in mattresses, and I just actually I didn't buy a new one. I flipped it over. Well, no, I um I, I averaged all the prices out of new mattresses that I needed. I threw the old one away. Listen to me, sir. Yes, ma'am. Listen to me very carefully. Don't fall over your tongue. You look stupid. You don't want to look stupid, do you? No. You see, because I made him look stupid. Her a little bit. The only one who's coming out of this thing whole is Asia. I'd hold on to her if I were you. But don't lie to me. I don't like it. Okay. You threw away the mattress, and first you say you bought a new one, then you say you didn't buy one, but you averaged out the costs. Who are you living with now? Asia. Asia, do you have an apartment? Yes, I do. Have a one-bedroom apartment? Two-bedroom. Two bedrooms. Who else lives there? My girlfriend. So you split the rent? Yes, we do. How many ways? Three. One, two, three. And mm -hmm. he shares your room? Yes. And you sleep on the floor? <laughs> no. You sleep on a? Bed. Which has a mattress. Perfect. Judgment for the plaintiff in the amount of $1,733. You have a mattress, Mr. Boyer. That's all. Thank you. Bodies are excused. You may step out. Lori Torres is suing her ex husband, Eric Bush, for the balance on an Isuzu rodeo. Lori says Eric is trying to pull a fast one. Ms. Torres, this uh, gentleman used to be your husband. Yes, ma'am. And he was your husband for a relatively short period of time. Yes, ma'am. You and your husband decided that since you had resolved all of the financial issues, there were very limited financial issues, that you got one of those quick divorces. You got in a little kit that you bought in a stationery store, one, two, three, 50 bucks, in and out. Yes, ma'am. But this was the problem. When you separated, according to what I've read in your complaint, there were two cars. Yes. The two of you decided that he would keep the automobile that was titled in your name. Yes, ma'am. There was still a loan outstanding on that automobile, and Mr. Bush agreed that he would take full responsibility for that car by taking care of the payments on the car, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma and taking care of the insurance on the car. Generally yes, taking care of everything on the car. It was your car, but it was still in her name because you had lousy credit. So far, correct? Yes, ma'am. And you had the car for six or seven months. Yes. So you had one car, she had the other. One car that you were driving was now your car, although it was in her name, was stolen. Yes, ma'am. When was it stolen? Around March, end of March. And in what month did you start driving the car exclusively? What month did you separate and take that car? Uh, October, November. That's six months. Yes, ma'am. In the time that you had the car, did your former wife drive the car? No, ma'am. When you were living together, did you have insurance on both cars? Yes, ma'am. When you took this car, did you get a separate policy of insurance? No, ma'am. How did you deal with it? We both had both vehicles on the same policy. Who paid the bill? We split it. She paid what her car was, I paid mine. So it all worked out beautifully? Yes. Until the car got stolen? Yes. And there was a deficit that was owed on the car 
to the loan company. Yes. Mr. Bush, you say that there was a $4,000 deficit. You wrote out a check for $2,000, and you said to Ms. Torres, I paid enough. Rest is yours. No, ma'am. We spoke about this prior, previously before, before the insurance came back and made the payment to the uh, loan company, which didn't cover the, the uh, remaining amount. We spoke about that previously, about and splitting it. You did? Yes, ma'am. Well, tell me about the conversation. Well, ma'am, we, we spoke about it. I told her, you know, the car wasn't in my name. I didn't have the car. You know, he had it before we were married and even together. She made the bad decisions when she purchased the car, which put the car in debt automatically. And I told her, I said, you know, I've taken care of it. We've gone back and forth. You know, I didn't want the vehicle from the get-go, but I took Just it. Just a second. Listen to me. When you say you had discussions about it, did you come to an agreement? Is that what you're getting to? Or you yes, just All I'm hearing is you told her. What did she agree to? We agreed that the, whatever the insurance company did not pay, we would split it 50-50. Good. Is that what you agreed to? No, ma'am. There was no way I was in the position Why would to she make do a deal that, Mr. to Bush? pay for half of the vehicle. Why would she do that? I don't know. Why would she? Because it was her I don't vehicle. believe that she did. No. It was your car. Let me ask you this question, sir. Let's say you kept this car for 20 years and it became a classic, not an old wreck. It became a classic. And during that 20 years time that it's in her name, you finished paying off the car, you put a lot of money into the car, you put new paint into the car, you put new rims in the car, and you're going to sell it. And you have an opportunity to sell that car for a lot more than it was paid for initially. How would you feel if Ms. Torres came to you and said, listen, the car's in my name, I want the money? What would you say? I'd be upset. Oh, why would you be upset? The car's in her name. Because I invested time into that. Well, but you made bad choices. Yeah. You invested in a car that wasn't in your name. You invested in it, you put in rims on it, you put in new paint, you put in new insides, and all of a sudden she comes back and she says, listen, it was really nice of you. Car's in my name. I just sold it for $15,000. You said, well, at least let's split it. She said, I don't want to split it with you. I want the whole thing myself. It's in my name. Isn't that what you're saying to me, Mr. Bush? You're saying, I agreed to keep the car, she kept one, I kept the other, I made the payments faithfully, but something bad happened to the car. Why should I be responsible for what happened bad to the car when the car was in her name? Explain to me how that's different from the scenario that I just gave you. She didn't invest a lot of time and money into that car. I did. <laughs> Do you see how foolish you sound, Mr. Bush? Very foolish. Now, you had a choice. You could have said, for all intents and purposes, this is my car which is really what you said to her back in October. You said, it's my car. I can take my girlfriend out in it. I can take my fiancé out in it. I can take it to my wedding. I can take it on my honeymoon. You have nothing to do with this car. You do have a new girlfriend, right? No. Well, you did have, I because did. according to you, just a second. Mm. Ah, maybe, maybe I'm thinking about the wrong, the wrong Mr. Bush. Hold on a second. Are you the same Mr. Bush? that wrote right here. I had, I'm write a check for $2,000 directly to the finance company. Yes, what happened to that girlfriend? It ended. Did you give her back the $2,000? Yes. Oh, you see, you can't even look at me in the eye and say I gave her back the $2,000. She got it back. I doubt it. So, Mr. Bush, you see you did have a choice, sir. If this was your car, you could have increased the premium on the insurance and had a $500 deductible if the car had been stolen, they would have paid you practically everything for the car, right? That was your choice. You could have paid a little bit more insurance and the car would have been completely covered. It was your car. That was your agreement with her. It was going to be your car. You just couldn't have a car in your name, couldn't get it financed because you had bad credit. Why did you have such bad credit? It's not because I had bad credit, ma'am. It's because I had my Harley loan and the car that she's driving is in my name also. So with two vehicle loans to get another vehicle. Was the Harley insured on the same policy? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Three months after he left, he reinsured it through our policy without really? my knowledge. Just a second. So you know how to get cars covered. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is this your first marriage? Yes, ma'am. How long did it last? Less than one year. Perfect. You have no children together? No, ma'am. Even better. <laughs> You say somebody was watching over me. Definitely. Somebody was watching over me. Right. Slick. How much is owed on the car? How much are they coming after you for? The remaining balance is $2,226.37. $2,226? Yes, ma'am. How many cents? 37 cents. And I see the letter, please. That's the statement, and that's the remaining balance.
And the name of this loan company is? Franklin Capital Corporation. You don't mind if he writes his check directly to them, do you? No, ma'am. But I'm also suing for the November payment and December payment I made for oh, him. Oh, you did? Yes, ma'am. 2226 plus 535 for November. January's late fees of $15, 528 for February, and $15 late fees for that also. I have 3319. Mr. Bush, you have to act responsibly, sir. Ladies aren't going to bail you out forever. You're not that good looking. <laughs> Judgment for the plaintiff, you made out to $3,319. That's all. Jessica Logger says former friends Brent and Nick Boots vandalized her car by jumping on the hood and. Thank you, Bert. Ms. Mm -hmm. Logger, these two young men used to be friends of yours, and it is your claim that some time ago they vandalized your car while they were probably drunk, acting like fools. What's your last name? Boots. And yours? Boots. Are you brothers? Yes, we are. The Boots brothers? Yep. Yeah. You ought to make a movie out of it. <laughs> Boots brothers. They say it wasn't them. When did this happen, Ms. Logger? On my 21st birthday, June 3rd, 2006. And where was your car at the time? It was at my boyfriend's mother's house, to the Foley's. That would be you? Yes. Could you stand up? Because you weren't there. Correct. I was not there. When had you parked your car in front of your boyfriend's mother's house? Well, I was letting her borrow it for quite some time because her vehicle was getting fixed at the time. What kind of car did you have? It's a 2001 Nibiru Deu. Could you keep your voice up? I'm old. It was a 2001 Nibiru Deu. What is that? It's a four-door. So a Nibira? Nibira. Where is that made? I believe Korea, but I'm not sure. I never heard of it. I'm so pleased that you didn't. <laughs> I'm sure it's a lovely car. It was a lovely car. Ms. Foley, do you remember June 3rd, 2006? Yes. I knew you were home on June 3rd, 2006. Yes. Which one of the Boots boys is going to speak? I will. And what is your first name? Brent. And yours? My name's Nick. No, I think I want Nick to speak. <laughs> <laughs> now, Nick. How far do you live from Miss Foley? Only like two blocks. You have any reason to be near Miss Foley's house? I'm best friends with their kid. Keep your voice up, Nick. I'm best friends with their son. What's her son's name? Bart. Is that person here today? No, nah, he's not. Your younger brother? Yeah, it was my younger brother. How long have you been friends? Since I was like two. Tell me about June 2006. Well, no, no, no. Don't look there. Don't look there. Well, we were at her house and, sorry, we were at her house, like, having a party or whatever, chilling, just a get together. I How many say. people were there? Just, like, four of us. Which four? The two Boots boys? Her. And then my girlfriend was there, and then her son was there. There were five of you there. That would be five. Let's count or them. other than me. Nick, you want to count them? <laughs> that would be five altogether, right? And when had you started chilling? I'm not sure what time it was. Around nine or so, I'd say. Eight or nine. And then what happened, Nick? Uh -huh. We just had a, we were just drinking and whatnot, and then we left. Drinking? What were you drinking? Vodka. Where did you get the vodka from? I just believe. No! <laughs> Don't speak unless I speak to you. I want Nick. Don't speak. Where did you get the vodka from? I believe it was from her, because it was from her first birthday. Jessica. Was she home? No. Well, where did you get the vodka from? We met up with them earlier on that day. And she gave you a bottle of vodka? Well, we, she purchased it for us. We gave her the money. So you gave Miss Logger the cash, and she went into a liquor store and purchased how much vodka? A liter. A liter. That's a big bottle, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty big. <laughs> and what were you mixing the leader with? Uh, we were just taking shots and drinking pop. Shots and pop? Shots and pop, yes. And then what happened? Nothing. We all had fun, and then once the night was over, we all went home. I didn't see Miss Logger's car. No. Miss Logger, did you purchase vodka for them? No, I did not. No, I do not purchase vodka for underage minors. Why do you think furry? To make it look good for themselves. Nah. They could have just said, you know, they found it. So I believe that you purchased it for them. It was my 21st birthday. Why would I purchase alcohol for them? I have no idea, because they were with your boyfriend's little brother. 
I wasn't even near them all day. I was with my mother all day. Okay. Miss Foley, tell me what you saw on June 3rd with regard to the Boots Boys and Miss Logger's car. I was at home. My son Bartley came up late that night and said, Mother, Brent and Nick are out kicking in Jesse's car. You need to come out and make him stop. So I went down, I looked out the landing, Brent was on the hood of the car, the roof of the car. Brent, why couldn't you let Nick go on the hood of the car? <laughs> <laughs> so I went down two more flights of stairs. By the time I got out there, Brent was off of the car, standing by the passenger mirror. Nick was standing in front of the car, trying to kick the headlight. And um, he had stated to me that he had kicked the headlight and it didn't break. And Brent said he kicked the mirror off, but it didn't come off all the way. And, I asked him why they were doing that, and they were mad at Jessica, I guess, at the time, so... Why were you mad at Jessica? We were mad at Jessica, but... Well, tell me why you were mad at her. I just want to know why you were she mad at her. She stole a digital camera from my ex-girlfriend out of our house. Oh, then I don't believe that she bought you alcohol. There you go. See what happened? If you were mad at her, why would you give her money to buy you alcohol on the same Even day? After she was always that. around anyways. Oh. I used to be best friends with him over there, her boyfriend. We all hung out every day. Now, she's the mother of your really good friend, right? Yes. So you know her for a long time. Most of my you life. You go to her house? Put your hand down. You go to her house? Every day, practically. She sometimes gives you a sandwich? Yeah. You know? I eat over there occasionally, I could say. So you think there's any reason why she would lie about you? No. I wouldn't see a reason why she would. Why would she lie about her son's best friend, who she sees every day of his life, who she's very good to? Why would she lie about him? I don't do know. Do you understand my problem here, Nick? Yes, I do. You know where I'm coming from? Sort of, yeah. Are you twins? No. <laughs> Who's older? I'm older. What about your older brother here? Did he ever go over to Miss Foley's house? Yep. Eat at her house? We didn't really know much people in the area, so we were there all the time. And Miss Foley was always nice to you? Most of the time, yes. Can you think of any reason why she would tell such a horrendous lie about you vandalizing a car that she was driving? Huh? Um, maybe because Jessica's going to give her some money for it or something? No. Then you would have to say that she's a liar and a thief. She is. Miss Foley? Oh, not Miss Foley, but Jessica. I'm talking about Miss Foley. No, she's not a thief. Miss Foley is the one who identified you, not Miss Lager. You want to look at Miss Foley and tell her she's a liar? On this Nick! Point, yes. You want to look at Miss Foley and tell her she's a liar? You followed your brother. Yeah. No, say this. Miss Foley, you're a liar. I wish she wouldn't lie. That's what uh -huh. I mean. <laughs> Evidently, you were a better friend than your older brother, because you couldn't say it. Now, when you do something wrong, you're supposed to fess up. Now, it's possible that you two morons don't remember, because you were drinking a liter of vodka what you did on the night of June 3rd. That's possible. How old are you? I'm 19. And you? 21. Can I see an estimate on fixing your car in the photographs, please? Oh. Are you still friendly with her younger son? Not really. Was he also involved? Well, you don't know. Was your youngest son involved in this? He didn't. No. Nope. Was oh, he? Just a second. No. Nope. He did not do anything to the car. Did you want to say something? I was going to say I thought you were talking about him, but I am friends with her youngest son, yes. No, I asked if her youngest son did anything to this car. No, he wasn't there. He was upstairs the whole time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you hear what he said? He said, no, he wasn't there. He was upstairs all the time. They just let them go and go and go, and after a while, they just, you know. See, they'll sign off. They just sign off on it, right? It was in an accident. Yeah, her car was in an accident before that, and it was all dented, and she was trying to say that we did all that when it couldn't How possibly... much did you do? I didn't do nothing. Well, yes, you did. No, no I didn't. Yes, see, yes, you did. Now, if you said to me, listen, we got a little drunk, and we acted stupid around the car, but a lot of this damage was done before. This stuff I'll happens all the time in our area. What, that you jump People... on the hood of a car? No. <laughs> then uh... I asked you a question. Your brother couldn't say it. If Miss Foley identified you two boys, boys who were lifelong friends of one of her children, there would have to be a reason. Because when people identify someone who's caused damage to their property, they want the right people punished. 
They don't want the wrong people punished. They want the right people to pay for the damage. Now, if she had some axe to grind with you, I could understand it. But you've given me no motive for her to lie about it. She wasn't even there. This is completely false and erroneous. And <laughs> yeah, no, you're erroneous. No, <laughs> you're erroneous and irrelevant. Erroneous and, and irrelevant. The car's not even worth that much. To be Abs you're absolutely right. How much did you pay for the car? Around seven thousand. Okay, well, I'm not going to give you eleven thousand dollars to fix it. No, I don't. No. Want that much. <laughs> you could go buy yourself a new car. Car can't even drive down the road straight. You let go of the wheel and you'll Listen, be in the Listen, you ditch. couldn't walk straight. That's not up to you, young man. That's not up to you. When you damage somebody's property, you take it as you take it. That's it. And when you act like a fool, that's why they don't let people drink until they're 21 years old, because even 21-year-olds are morons. 20-year-olds and 19-year-olds are double morons. They shouldn't even be allowed out of the house after 9 o'clock at night. <laughs> Judge them for the plaintiff in the amount of $3,500. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Anna. Parties are excused. You may step out. Xin chào tất cả mọi người. Chào mừng mọi người đã quay trở lại channel của mình. Hôm nay mình sẽ hướng dẫn mọi người cách làm một chiếc giỏ sách có dán hình mình bánh pizza nhé. Ở đây mình sẽ sử dụng tờ giấy màu xanh và vàng Tiếp theo dụng cụ gồm gò kéo, bút chì, thước, bút màu, hồ keo Giờ chúng ta sẽ bắt tay và làm nhé Đầu tiên thì mình sẽ kể kích thước của chiếc hộp này Mình sẽ kể với kích thước là 8 x 8 Tiếp đó thì mình sẽ cắt sợi dài để làm phần quay sách
theo đó thì mình sẽ vẽ hình nền bánh pizza lên trên tờ giấy màu vàng nhé Như vậy là chiếc giỏ sách của mình đã hoàn thành xong Nếu như mọi người cảm thấy video này hay và có ích Hãy để lại cho mình một like, share và đăng ký kênh nhé Hẹn gặp lại mọi người ở những video tiếp theo